Today, inshallah, we're going to be discussing uh, the end of what we began regarding the journey to the hereafter. And of course, there is so much to discuss, and ulama have already discussed so much that I can't I can't say there is a comprehensive uh, response because in reality there is uh, I mean this is something there is entire volumes written about. There is introduction of Al-Qadr, kind of a, a way to get your mind around what's what's ahead of us. And the hereafter, Mawt, Qabr, Barzakh, Hasha, Yawm al Jannah, Wal-Nar, these are realities that are coming for all of us. Now, there was a question asked earlier, and I'm going to address that here inshallah ta'ala. Regarding the issue, well, where do we get this knowledge from? Right? Meaning, many people can make claims. Right? Somebody could say, you know what, when you die, you become a turtle. You know? <laughs> Uh, there are Hindus out there that would believe in reincarnation, you know, meaning that when you die, you come back to be a different type of creature, right? Somebody might say you come back as a snail or as a donkey, or if you're really good, then as a cow, which again, I'm not sure how that would be very good because you become burgers and steaks and stuff, right? But this is people and their strange beliefs, right? Now, when we discuss such an issue, there is a core component that Islam has that nobody else has. Which is we do not base our ideas of the hereafter on a philosophy, on a thought, uh, on a understanding or based on errors and mistakes and we can learn. We base our understanding of what is in this world and what is in the hereafter upon the Kitab Musul, upon the Quran and what is authentically is authentically established on Al Mustafa alayhi salatu salam upon the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. So that's very important because now, how do we know the Quran and what is established then authentically from the Prophet is correct? Right? You can ask that question. Our belief is based upon evidences, not blind faith. Right? The Quran is a miracle in itself. There are scientific facts that were mentioned that could not have been known by the Prophet ﷺ at the time. This is something well known. Many books have been written on this issue. We can look at the works of Dr. Mears Brikai, you know, Dr. Zakir Naik and others have published works on this. Not just that. There are many classic scholars like Ibn Kathir and others that have mentioned certain ayat that discuss, for example, the uh, the, the orbit of the heavenly bodies, the planets and sun and the moon, very classic scholars, I mean, hundreds of years ago, 700, 600,000 years ago, that discussed these issues. That yes, this is what the Quran says, and the people didn't know this at the time, and this is what the ayah means, and many issues like that. So that tells you that you have miracles there that show that this book is not something that was written by the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, for the miracles of the Quran is that it was revealed to a man who couldn't read or write. Right? So that, I mean, if the Qur'an was revealed to some eloquent poet from the Arab, you know, one of the Sahaba, Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, was, was an eloquent poet. So the, if Allah had chosen him as the Nabi, then no doubt people could say, you know what, he was eloquent, he was a poet, he wrote it himself. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, for example, he could write. Right? But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah could not read or write by the consensus of historians and he was not a poet like he didn't know poetry the Arab had many famous poets the Quraysh, Banu Hashim and they all had their poets but he wasn't one of them right? so how can an illiterate man 
bring forth a book that the best of the poets of the Arab, the most eloquent poets who used to write thousands of lines of poetry, could not respond. They said, no way. Hassan ibn Thabit, for example, he was a poet. When he heard the Quran, he said, this is not the poetry of any man. And he became a Muslim. Right? The Quran is perfect. Right? What, what a child. And I asked him, how did you become Muslim? He said, you know what? I wanted to... even this and that and so on, right? And then it's like, well, people make mistakes. You know, like, <laughs> well, people do make mistakes, but God doesn't, right? Well, I mean, everybody has errors, not Allah, right? And that's why the Quran puts such a challenge out. So if somebody is to admit that yes, this book has mistakes, then the problem is, how can you put your hereafter, your everlasting life and bet it on something that has mistakes. Right? How can you take that chance? When we as Muslims say that we put our belief in a book that is perfect. Right? A miraculous book. A book that challenged people to produce something like it and more than 1400 years after the revelation of the Quran, nobody's been able to meet, meet that challenge. The Bible, if you look at it, how many Bibles are there? Right? I mean, what is the Bible? Is it something that contains chapters like Tobit and, you know, that are included in the Catholic Bible? Or is it something that doesn't have that chapter like the Protestant Bible? Does the Book of Mormon constitute to be a part of the Bible, right? What about the Gospel of James and, and, and Mary Magdalene and, and the Gospel of Judas and so many other books that at times in different collections would be found in the Bible, but the King James Version doesn't have it. Okay? So what is the Bible? <laughs> if you look at the differences between the Greek Orthodox Bible, the Ethiopian Bible, the Syrian Bible, the you know, Catholic Bible, the Protestant Bible, you will find different chapters. I don't mean different translations. I don't mean different pronunciations, right? Like if you say, God loveth the earth, that he so, you know, or if you say, God loved the earth, so he sent his son, right? You see how I pronounce it differently? Elongation and so, right? Or if you say, God loved the earth so much, right? Those are all different pronunciations. You shorten the vowels or you strengthen them or you, or you change the way you say it, right? Those are all acceptable. For example, if I was to say, these are my peoples, right? People say, these are my peoples, right? Well, many people would say people is jama, it's, it's the plural, you can't say peoples, right? But there are accents in English that say peoples, right? It's referring to the same thing, people or peoples, it's referring to your people, right? But that's acceptable because the English language, we have that difference in accent. The Quran is the same way, there are qiraat, which are derived from the ahruf, and I've discussed this in detail. But have you ever, from all the people here, raise your hands, if you've ever seen a Qur'an that is not 114 chapters? Have you ever seen a Qur'an that doesn't begin with Al-Fatiha? Or end with Al-Nas? Or have 30 juz? Or Al-Baqarah is not after Al-Fatiha? Al-Imran? 
So we have one Quran, alhamdulillah, preserved in that perfection, miraculously, memorized. Right? So if a Christian was to come forward and say, that yes, we believe in the Bible, we're going to bet our hereafter and we believe in the resurrection, we believe in you know, all of this, even though it has mistakes and the whole thing is corrupted and we know, we would say that, well, how could you do that? How would you know where the errors are from not the errors? You know, I'll give you an easy example. Let's say you were going to take your medical board exam, right? Which is a very serious exam, right? You want to be a doctor, right? And I have two study guides. One of them I tell you is perfectly exactly what you need to study, no issues. I challenge anybody to find a single issue in it. I can guarantee you that 100% it is authentic. It is what has been sent down, right? This is one option. You can study from this. Or I have this other one, which I know has mistakes, and from the beginning to end there are mistakes, and there are wrong answers in it, and they contradict each other, and one of them mentions one answer, one of them mentions the other answer for the same question, or you can use that one. What would you use? The perfect one. Yeah, it's simple. So if you admit that this book has mistakes, and if you admit that this has human errors, and you admit that this has got copious errors, then leave that alone and come to that which is perfectly preserved. So our aqidah, our belief, is not based on things like even the Gita or the Puranas, or which are Hindu texts, right? The Virdas, right? Written by anonymous and sometimes unknown and sometimes known and different authors with different contradictory beliefs and you know, things that developed over time. No. Our belief is not, uh, you know, there's a, there's a church of... Uh, uh, Christian science, right? So there's an actual church, and they believe in absolutely no medicine. You know, they say Jesus heals. You know, so they don't take any medicine. And every year you have cases where their children die because they don't give them medicine. You know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, they don't have blood transfusion, right? All these kinds of strange things. Because when people start messing with it, they get these strange things. But Islam, because it's a divine message, preserved by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, it stays perfect. Our belief is not based on Buddha, some you know, figure that we don't even know if actually existed or didn't exist and what exactly he wrote or didn't write and you know, how many Buddhas are in you know, all this kind of confusion. Our belief is clear, pure. When somebody says this is it, you can ask them where is that in the Quran? Where is that in the, in the Sunnah of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam? Even when we have hadith, we have a whole science in checking a hadith. Right? This is very important for us to know. That if something is corrupted, if something is changed, if something, you know, it's not like one manuscript that has a mistake. When today you're saying that your printed Bible that you're giving out to everybody has crazy amounts of errors, then that would mean that we cannot accept such a thing. Allah. So I've gotten sent a message. Uh, TIC sponsored five students yesterday for the Authentic Elm Institute. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward them for it. Uh, we can pick five more. They will cover the costs for registrations and books. Um, so, inshallah, if people are interested in registering, please let me know, and we can, uh, alhamdulillah, help people to register, even if you have, you know, not the ability to register from prices. Alhamdulillah, AIM and TIC were working together with the Salahuddin Future Academy uh, and Salahuddin Islamic Center to present this knowledge and we're not trying to make money off of it, right? We want students to take it serious but we're willing to put everything free and if anybody needs even for the credited courses um, any some kind of funding, we can help, inshallah. Tell you. So now, what we have established is that our aqidah, our belief is based on that perfect book that is preserved, right? Not on philosophies of men, not on things with mistakes, not things of anonymous authors. For example, even if you look at the Gospels, we don't really know who wrote them. The book of Hebrews, I mean, even Christian commentaries will say, yeah, don't know who wrote it. It's anonymous. Could be this, could be that, could be this, could be that, you know. No, the Quran is the words of Allah. 
We know even the scribes like Zayd ibn Thabit and Muawiyah radiyallahu that wrote down as the wahi was being revealed. We have the sanad even in our qur'at. We have the chain of narrators all the way back to the Prophet sallallahu to Jibreel alayhi salam, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how beautiful it is. So one of the things, and this hadith, its asal is found in the sahih of Imam Muslim. And its original base is found in the sahih of Imam Muslim. And versions of it, yani those that give certain details and so on, are found in other books of hadith. Is about the last person to enter Jannah. You know, we talked about in the earlier durus, the Day of Judgment and Qabar and all of that, right? Now you have people that have entered Jannah. They've been given their book in their right hand. They enter, they're living in there. And then there are people who are kuffar that have entered the nar. Their punishment is abadan fiha, yani forever in it. But there are believers, because of their sins, because of their mistakes, because they didn't make tawbah, because of whatever they died upon that was uncleansed, yani from the filth of sinning, may Allah protect us all and cleanse us all, that they go to the nar to be cleansed. Right? And these people, they are people of Tawheed, yani they do believe. But yani some people, you know, we see many people who are Muslim, but are alcoholics or whatever, engaged in mafia lifestyles. They die upon such a thing. They don't make tawbah in the dunya. The punishments of the qabr and the day of judgment are not enough to cleanse them. May Allah protect us from all this. But even then, because they're people of Tawheed, because they believe in the oneness of Allah, because they have that, they will be taken out from the hellfire. Because the asal of Tawheed is Jannah. But as Ibn al-Qayyim's statement I mentioned in the earlier durus, that it's a place for the pure of sin, so they had to get cleansed. Now, never fool yourself with this. Remember that you never want to go to Jahannam even for a minute. You don't want to even see it. You don't want to even smell it. It's that horrible of a place. Right? So always work to enter Jannah directly without hisab. Whenever you find a hadith about Amal, actions that enter you into Jannah Like the 70,000 that will enter Jannah Without hisab because of their Tawakkul Because they don't depend on you know, charms And you know, they don't put ta'weed and things They, they depend slowly on, slowly on Allah Even ruqya Which is permissible To ask somebody to read Quran on you Ruqya, shari'i Even that they don't ask anybody else They do their own because they have that direct connection with Allah. So 70,000 will enter Jannah without hisab. And another hadith mentioned that with each one, another 70,000 or so on, uh, uh, so that there are many of them. So may Allah make us from them. Okay? That's how you want to be. That's how you want to live. But this person that enters the hellfire, he sees the people of Jannah having entered Jannah. And he is looking at the hellfire and Jannah. He is at, he's taken out, but he's stuck at the gate. And he says, Oh Allah, just take me out of the hellfire. Like this is all I ask of you. Take me out of the hellfire, and this is all I'm going to ask. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being his Rabb, subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, my slave, I'll take you out. Like Allah is so merciful. But then you're going to ask me for more. And he will say, no, no, Allah, Ya Allah, by your honor, I swear by you, I'm not going to ask for anything else. Right? Because when you're in that type of hardship, you just want to get out. You know, like I, I don't know if you've ever been like in a stressful situation. You say, Ya Allah, just get me out of this. That's it. I'm not going to ask for anything else. And many times Allah will get you out of it. And then you ask for more. <laughs> That's the nature of insan. But Allah loves us and He knows. So Allah will take him out, but his face will be facing the hellfire. He'll be outside at the gate. And he will say, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, just turn my face away from hellfire. It's smoke, it's, 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 I'm inhaling it, it's fire, it's burning my face. That's how horrible even facing hellfire is. That's all I'm asking is to turn my face towards Jannah. Allah said, didn't I tell you that you were going to ask for more? All these promises you made that no that's all I'm going to ask but Allah is loving towards his creation even though this abd of Allah this slave of Allah this sinful slave and he had made this promise to Allah that I won't ask for anything but Allah knows that he's 
يعني معذور يا زوجر جهنم is so bad even facing it is so bad that you can't stand it and it tells you how beautiful the relationship between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you can always turn to Allah even if you're going through hardships and you're sinful and you did something wrong you can still make tawbah you can still turn to Allah and Allah will always answer you. Allah will always answer you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, then asked the slave, okay, what do you want? He says, oh Allah, just turn my face towards the Jannah. I just want to turn away from the hellfire. And like I said, there are different narrations. I'm just kind of summarizing and combining for your benefit. And when he's turned away, he can now see Jannah the gates of Jannah and the people of Jannah and his face is no longer being burnt by the heat of the hellfire he's not inhaling all that smoke he's not dealing with that horrible sight right so he's like that's it that's all I want but see the hereafter is very long you know, it's not a short time it's forever and ever right so after a while he's looking at these beautiful things of Jannah and he's like yeah Allah <laughs> again he had said, I'm not going to ask for anything else. He goes, Ya Allah, just let me enter Jannah. <laughs> and there are I mean, a hadith that mentioned details. I'm going to summarize here, right? He will continue to ask and keep moving closer to the gate, to inside, until Allah allows him to enter Jannah. Now these are, again, like I said, it's not one single hadith. These are many hadith I'm bringing together, right? And one of them, and the authentic hadith, mentions when he's the last person to enter Jannah. He's the last person. And Allah will ask, tell him, enter Jannah. And when he enters, even though the Jannah is huge, right? it's unimaginably big for us in this dunya, but in the hereafter, you have that ability to see in things that you couldn't see in this dunya, right? He, when he sees inside, he will say, Allah, it's full. People have taken their places, you know, there are, uh, I mean, so much detail, I don't want to sidetrack, right? But, you know, shuhada and their jannah, and Abu Bakr radiyan and his jannah, and imagine, ulema and their jannah, and, you know, there are a hundred levels in jannah just for the shuhada, just for those that are martyrs, right? And Jannah is so beautiful. Everybody has Jannah, Tan, two Jannahs, you know, and so on. So here this person will think Jannah is full. There's no room. You'll see Allah. There's nothing left for me. Now imagine, he was in hellfire and he was facing hell and all those times, right? And every step, Allah granted him and he said, I don't want anything else and granted it. But now when he enters Jannah, Allah tells him, look at the mercy of Allah. Look at the importance of the belief of Tawheed. If somebody is watching and you're not Muslim, at least, at least accept Islam. You may have your own struggles, you may have things you're going to have to try to fix and so on, but don't let that hold you back. Accept the Shahada. Because this Shahada is such that some of the ahadith, they mentioned that a person will come on the Day of Judgment with scrolls some narrations mention 99 huge scrolls that will all of them will be the bad deeds and the only thing they'll have in their scale of good deeds is just la ilaha illallah and this will outweigh all of that and the ulama have explained that this is somebody who dies at, and says the kalima at the time that that kalima was at the point of death so that's all he did otherwise you know every Muslim obviously makes some salah and things but that's all he did but that is enough so if you're not Muslim and you're watching at least believe in that there's only one Allah worthy of worship and that Muhammad is his messenger peace and blessings be upon him accept that believe in that because that will at least get you into Jannah this is the key that for entering Jannah so this person now when he's entering, he sees everything full. Allah tells him, what do you want? You think it's full? What if I gave you a Jannah 
like the size of this world. Imagine, this is the least Jannah. You know when you talk about leaving sins and striving to be good and sometimes it feels hard, but look at what you're working towards. You know, when you work a job, many times a boss will tell you, you know what, um, if you work at this time, you'll get overtime, right? And you've already worked your eight-hour shift, and you're tired, you know, and you, you want to go home and spend time with your family, or go out with your boys, or hang out with your sisters, or whatever, right? Men, women have different, right? Whatever you may have, but then you think, oh man, if I push myself a little bit and work an extra hour, I'll make twice what I was making. And then you think, okay, that's worth it, you know. And sometimes, and if you got a really good job, they'll say they'll give you triple time. And you're like, oh man, get the coffee, Tim Hortons. You know? <laughs> you know, we're gonna, I'm not advertising for them, I'm just in Canada, right? And you're gonna be like, I'm gonna push myself. Right? Why? Because you realize that what you're gonna get is such, of such value that you, you're willing to push yourself, right? If you wanna be a doctor, I mean, the studies are hard, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a long process. Years and years, you know, bachelors and then med school and then, uh, you know, we call them internship or residency or whatever, right? But then you think, man, you know how much money doctors make? I'm going to do it. I'm going to go through that hardship, right? If you want to be an astronaut, right? You know how much hardship, physical training and things you have to go through, right? But when you realize that the end is worth it, you do it. So that's, so that's the thing. Understand Jannah is so beautiful that Wallahi, it's worth the struggles. So here, he's told, that you will have a Jannah the size of this world. Right? Imagine, is there any king in this world that rules the whole world today? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rules everything. But from the creation, right? From human beings. Is there any president, any dictator, any king that rules the whole world? No. Today if there's a king in one country and he goes to another country, he has to and be under another king's laws, right? If there's a president from, for example, Mexico, and they come to Venezuela, or, you know, so on, they will have to come and be like, oh, you know, we're in your country, you know? So nobody, nobody on earth has such a kingdom, at least today, that they rule the whole world, right? But Allah will give that to the least person, and ten times like it. Allahu Akbar, and ten times like it as the whole world in ten times. Now this person, because he's the last person to enter Jannah, for him to be told that your personal Jannah is the size of the whole world and ten times like it, would be overwhelming to him. And he was, Ya Allah, are you joking with me? Like, are you mocking me? Because he, he will, it will be unimaginable to him. And Allah will tell him, no. This is what I'm giving you. Take that and more. And then Allah will tell him, ask. You look at how, how loving Allah is. Look at how merciful Allah is. Look at how generous Allah is. If you come and ask me, brother, can you just give me a drive to the hotel? I came from out of town. I might be like, oh man, I got things to do, but all right, man, I'm going to help a brother out. All right, I'll take you to the hotel. Then if I take you to the hotel and you tell me, Brother, Jazakallah khair for your hotel, but if you don't mind, can you take me to the store as well? Like, what? When I just brought you to the hotel, like I went out of my way, I got things to do, and now you're, ah, fine, man, I'll take you to the, you know, no problem, bro, I'll take you, right? And he's like, okay, can you just wait for me, I'm going to shop? Right? And then he's like, you, you mind paying for me? What up, bro? <laughs> you know? And, brother, can you take me at the restaurant where I want to pick up some food? Oh, it's on you today, right? And after a while, I'm like, yo, bro, this is all I can do. Khalas, salam alaykum, ma salam, I'm out, you know. But look at the generosity of Allah. He will take this person out of the fire. He will say, that's all I want. But then when he asks again to be turned his face away, Allah will give it to him. When he asks to face Jannah, Allah will give it to him. When he asks to get to the gates of Jannah, Allah will give it to him. When he asks to enter Jannah, every time he says, all I want, Allah will give it to him. And then Allah will give him the Jannah that is the size of the entire world and ten times, and then Allah will tell him, ask for more. 
Then this person will ask for more. Allah will give it to him. He will say, ask for more. He will ask for more. Allah will give it to him. He will say, ask for more. And he will ask for more. Allah will, then he will say, Allah, I don't know what else to ask for. Then Allah will tell him, I will tell you what to ask for. Ask for Ask for this. Ask for it. He couldn't even imagine Allah. Will, and Allah will give it to him. What's the most amazing and important thing here? That that Jannah never ends. You know, in this dunya, you could be famous, you could be rich, you know, you could be, let's say, like, you know, as an example, not that he's the greatest person or something, but as an example, you look at Andrew Tate, right? And he's a Muslim brother, whatever shortcomings he has, right? He had money, he had fame, at that time he was the most Googled name in the world. But he still got arrested. He still went through those hardships, right? May Allah ease the hardships of everybody on the world, right? He still gets sick, you know, he still has struggles every day, right? So like that, even if you're the most famous singer or the most famous actor or the most powerful politician or king or king maker, all this stuff, you still get sick. You're still going to die. I'm not going to take any of it with you. You know, Alexander the Great, you guys heard his name? You guys read history? No? Canadians? Yes? Yeah. Alexander the Great, as they call him, from Macedonia, you know, he was from Europe, around Greece, and he conquered a great amount of land, whether you like him or dislike him, not really. Right? But he immensed a lot of wealth. And this is non-Muslims that have written about this. You know, historians. I looked this up. And then he got sick. And he was young at the time. And he was dying. So he called the best doctors of the time. Imagine he was like this huge, he had a huge kingdom, you know, stretched from Europe to, you know, northern Africa, parts, you know, like Alexandria is named after him, right? Throughout, you know, the Middle East into like, you know, the Indian subcontinent and parts like that, you know, parts of what's currently uh, under Russia and so on. All of this was under his kingdom, right? So huge kingdom, young guy. But now he's dying, so he calls all these physicians, all these doctors, and he tells them, look, money is not an issue. I have robbed and plummaged and taken. I'll give, I'll give you all the money you want. Resources, not an issue. You know, whatever, I'll, I'll save me. And in the end, the doctors tell him, you know what, we can't. You're going to die. Because death and life in the hands of Allah. If a doctor could save you, then doctors wouldn't die. You know? If money could let you live, the rich would never die. No. Life and death in the hands of Allah cures hands of Allah. When COVID hit, Many rich people died from it. It wasn't like only the boat died from it, right? So, after he realizes, Alexander, that there's no saving him, he says, okay, I have three instructions. He said, one, when, you're, when I die, and you're taking me for my burial, put my treasures on the ground. Everything that I've collected of gold and silver and jewels and wealth, put it on the ground and walk over it. I want you to Akramakallah. I want you to walk over it. Right? So here he tells them to show the world that this is what the worldly treasures get left behind. Now Allah Alam, but he's not a Muslim. Historically we don't know him to be a Muslim. Some people say he's Dukar right now. But anyway. But he realized that the worldly treasures, even as a king, even as a powerful, well, nothing goes with you. And he says, so that's the first thing. Second thing, I want my physicians, my doctors, to carry my body to the grave. So the world can see that these doctors are not able to save me, they're taking me to the grave. I don't want anybody else to carry my body. I want those physicians, those doctors to show the world. And the last thing, he said, I want you to leave my hands outside the coffin. Leave my hands exposed. So people can see that Alexander the Great 
is leaving this world with his hands empty. Nothing he's taking with him. Right? So what does that tell you? That in this dunya, no matter what, it's going to finish. Every hardship, every pleasure, it finishes. But the akhirah, the jannah, is forever and ever. Khalidun. Forever they live in it. Right? Khalidina fiha. Abada. So many ayat. Right? So here what happens is, when you enter jannah, as the least amount, you get ten times this world and more than that, and more than that. But the most wonderful thing is it will never end. You will enjoy it forever. You know in dunya, you can't see Allah. This is a funny, you know, in the Bible, it also says, in the Old Testament, that you can't see God. And then obviously the disciples saw Jesus, so it can't be God, right? <laughs> Their own work, right? And we know Islamically that in this dunya you can't see Allah. Musa alayhi salam couldn't even bear to look at the reflection of the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the mountain. Let alone looking at Allah directly. Right? Even Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi salam when he went on Isra al-Mi'raj he met Allah but there was a, 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 a cover of light between them. But in the akhirah you can see Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that just, he asked the Sahaba, right? And it's uh, information for us. That do you have any hardship looking at the full moon, moon, when it's clear, on a clear night, the full moon, on the Badr. Do you have any problem looking at the moon? Like, you know, if you guys go out at night and it's a clear night, and it's the night, you know, of the 15th, where the moon is full, do you have any problem looking at it? No, you see it very clearly. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us that like, you have no problem seeing the moon, you will have no issue, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's amazing. Right? So in Jannah, you have those abilities. So in Jannah, you can handle things you couldn't handle in dunya. In dunya, what's your favorite ice cream, brother? Vanilla. Vanilla? That's pretty plain, but alright. So, if I gave you vanilla ice cream, you would like it, right? Like this is good. What if I locked you in a room and only gave you vanilla ice cream every day, all day? Right? After a while, you'll get sick of it. You'll be like, I hate vanilla. I don't want to look at it. The smell is driving me crazy. It's enough. I need to eat something else. Right? Because in dunya, whatever you may even enjoy, overindulgence makes you bored of it. You know? You know, I don't, I mean, inshallah, you guys don't waste time with video games, but. I know a lot of you do because you know, it's just reality, right? So you get a new game and you'll be like, this is the funnest game ever, man. It's got some crazy challenge. Look at these graphics. Look at this, right? You're loving it. And then if you play it and play it and play it, after all, you're like, man, I'm bored. I beat all the levels. Khalas, man. You got to get a new game, right? But this is not the fact. This is not the way in Jannah. In Jannah, you never get bored of things. You know why you get bored of things in dunya? Because it wasn't meant to be forever. If you didn't get bored of things, you would get just attached to things, right? But in dunya, even if you love something, you're like, ah, khalas. You know? Because it was meant to be temporary. But Jannah is everlasting. So you don't get bored in Jannah. Every time you taste a fruit, it tastes better than the last. Every time you see your wife, she's more beautiful than before. Every time a wife sees her husband, he's more handsome than before. Every time that you enjoy a, a pleasure, its taste, its feeling is different and better than before. You never get bored. You live without disease. You live without separation. You know, you have family. Somebody's mother dies, somebody's brother dies, somebody's husband dies, somebody's child dies. It's very difficult. It's a hard thing. Right? But in Jannah, you will no longer have that. Forever you'll be together. You know? So this is why this journey to the hereafter is so important. And this is why we need to work so hard at making sure that we're saved from the hellfire and we're entered into Jannah. And why we need to save ourselves from even getting hisab, even being put to accountability. Do those amal that save you from even being put to that test. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from me and you and to make us from those that benefit from what we hear and act upon what we hear. And inshallah, the shuyukh are here.
so I will end myself uh, and my speak in speech inshallah to allow them to benefit you inshallah Jazakumullah khair Just kidding, I'm back. No, I'm just kidding. They said we have about five minutes, so since you guys have questions, might as well answer some. Fadalu, go ahead. You look at the belief of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the belief on the Athar, the Athari, they're all evident, clear. Al Rahman wa Al Arsh is clear. You know, the fact that Rasulullah you will see Allah in the hereafter is clear. The fact that Allah makes nuzul in the last part of the night it's clear, and that's why we believe in it. As Allah said it, without asking the how of it. That's it, right? But those people from the mutakallimin who deny that Allah has a wajh, right? They deny these things. They will deny very clear evidences, because again, our evidence is clear. But they'll give different meanings to it. You know, they'll say, well, seeing doesn't mean seeing. You know? <laughs> seeing means you'll feel it you know, or something, you know, whatever. Right? Nuzul doesn't mean nuzul. You know? Yad doesn't mean yad. And istawa doesn't mean istawa. And I'm like, oh, what is it? You know, I mean, like, you know they, they'll, they'll give it their own meanings. Whether it's, you know, from philosophy or from you know, their own metaphors. And, you know, and there are things of majaz in the Quran, but you look at adilla for that. But when you don't have any dalil to say majaz, then khalas, we take it as it is, as Allah revealed it, right? Without asking how. Allah knows best on the how, right? So, I've read the works of those that have denied that you will not see Allah, right? I've, I've debated with a few before in the past, you know, but there are. May Allah guide us in them. But our belief, the belief of the Ahl Sunnah, the belief of the people of the Athar, is whatever Rasulullah sallam said that is authentic from him, Whatever is in the Quran, we believe in it. That's it. Um, just regarding the, uh, the hadith about the last person to enter Jannah, I was uh, listening to one lecture and they say that it potentially could have been um, uh, there was a man who had a son hmm. and uh, he feared Allah so much and he said that he lived like a bad life and he committed many things. Right, he told his children to burn his body. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the hadith that mentioned that there was a man in the, in the nations before us, you know, bin Israel, that, you know, the hadith doesn't say that he lived in a, a bad life, but he tells his children that, look, I mean, I've done a lot of mistakes and things, but obviously he was still a person of Tawheed because he's still worried about Allah, right? So he tells his children that when I die, burn my body and, and scatter my ashes all over the world because I'm afraid to face Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathers his hashes because Allah can do everything. And if you, if you throw somebody in the ocean, it doesn't mean that Allah can't raise them on the day of judgment, you know. You can, you can throw ashes, but Allah can bring it together, right? So now Allah asks him, why did you do this? Because that's not the sharia, right? In Islam, we're not supposed to burn our bodies, we bury. And Allah asks him, why did you do this? He says, oh Allah, I was, I was afraid to face you with, you know, my, my mistakes. But obviously... He did many good things as well because he tells the children, have I been, not have been a good father? And they said, yeah, you've been the best father. So he wasn't like a horrible, horrible person, right? And then Allah would tell him, why did you do this? He said, because I feared facing you because of my sins and mistakes. And Allah will forgive them, right? So that means, yes, this is there. And yes, this means that we should always be you know, mindful of the mercy of Allah and things like this. But to say this is the one that's mentioned in the ahadith that mentioned that he's the, the last person entering, Wallahu alam. I don't see any dalil that connects him particularly. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, I think, uh, the Shafni, are we still doing questions or no? Sheikh Kamil is here. Inshallah, sorry, it's like Inshallah, Subhanallah, Go second.
So inshallah, Sheikh Uthman will be here the whole day tomorrow. So if you look at the the, the schedule, Authentic Ilm Institute, you'll see he's there for the whole day tomorrow as well, inshallah. Um, so that's just uh, letting you brothers know. Um, for the Authentic Ilm Institute as well, if we, uh, I know Sheikh Kareem picked five students um, yesterday. Uh, we're looking for, we were able to uh, to cover their, any of the book and everything else, inshallah. Um, Sheikh Uthman did announce five more, inshallah. We'll pick the five more tomorrow, if that makes sense. Uh, we want whoever we do pick to be dedicated, to be able to give back and to implement the knowledge that they learn, uh, inshallah. Inshallah. Zakum khair. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه آمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all, I'd just like to start off by reminding ourselves of the virtue of sitting here the way we are the Prophet Sallallahu says that there's no group of people who come together in one of the houses of Allah one of the masajid to recite the book of Allah to learn it to teach it except that four things happen Tranquility descends upon them And mercy surrounds them And the angels flock around them And the most special of all That Allah Imagine this Allah from above the seven heavens he mentions these people to those closest to him, the Malaika, the angels. And so let us remember this and let us purify our intentions. That while everyone else is, you know, sitting in their home comfortably, enjoying their long weekend, you're here gaining a lot of reward. And gaining these four 
benefits that the Prophet ﷺ mentions. We move on to the topic for this session, which is on the ghaib, the unseen. And so our belief concerning the matters pertaining to the akhirah and life after death, it falls under our iman bil ghaib, our iman in the unseen. And so when people ask you for evidence to prove that what happens after death is true, this is where you need to bring in, in discussion our belief in the unseen. And so if we're going to study in detail about the akhirah and what happens after death until people go into Jannah and the Hellfire, you need to, we need to discuss this matter. And so firstly we say that one of the distinct qualities of the believer is his belief in the unseen. Right? One of the first qualities that Allah mentions of the people of Iman الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بالغيب. Those who believe in the ghaib in the unseen. And this is the test of your Iman. This is what distinguishes you from everyone else. There will come a day when everyone will believe. Muslim or Kafir. But in this current life, in this current life, we are required to believe without seeing. Right? There will come a day when everyone will believe. They'll be forced to believe. Right? And that's when they die. Whether you're a Muslim or you're a Kafir. When you see the reality of life after death, once you have entered that realm, you have to believe, obviously, right? But before that happens, in this dunya, Allah has asked us to believe without seeing. And that is the ultimate test of our Iman that Allah wants to test us with. And so, if Allah concealed it from us, not allowing us to see it, then there's a reason for that. And that reason is to test us. To see who will believe in what they're told and who won't believe. Secondly, when we talk about evidence, we need to be clear about what we mean and how we Muslims view evidence. This is because a lot of people look at evidence and what constitutes evidence based on what they've been taught in school. That evidence is through observation. It's what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can touch. It's hard material evidence. And they show you that through scientific experiments, right? You do this experiment, the result, the result of the experiment becomes a fact, becomes a truth. What led you to believe that fact? The experiment, right? Which you observed through your senses. The reason why many of us look at evidence from this lens is because of how advanced and materialistic the world has become to such a degree that we're no longer interested in entertaining any evidence that is not scientifically supported. On top of that, the atheists of today, 
They're trying to force this type of evidence on everyone. Telling us that, you know, science where it's reached today has disproved the existence of God. And based on what we know from our scientific advancement in this day and age, God doesn't exist. You know, this is what they're trying to force on everyone, this idea. So now, when you come to such people with evidence of the existence of Allah or evidence of the Nubuwa, the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or evidence of the Quran they don't even bother exploring and investigating to see how true these proofs are Why? Because all they want is scientific evidence why? Because that's all they believe in. And this is nothing new. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us examples in the Quran of the kuffar and how they would treat the proofs, the ayat, the signs supporting the belief that the prophets and the messengers were truly indeed sent by Allah. How instead of looking into these signs and evidences, and contemplating how convincing they are, what would they demand? They would demand evidence that is material and observable in nature. Because according to them, that was the only way to prove for certain that the claim of the prophets is true. And they would say, as long as you bring us these evidences, they would say to the prophets, as long as you bring these evidences, then we'll believe. Then we will believe. And so, for example, the companions of Musa, even though these were believers, you know, Bani Israel, they made a similar demand to Musa alayhi salam. They said, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى لَمْ نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى نَرَى اللَّهَ جَهْرَى they said, Oh Musa, we won't believe in you until we see Allah with our own eyes. And Allah tells us of the kuffar of Quraysh and their demands. In Surah Al-Isra, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا We won't believe in you until you cause the earth to gush forth with springs, water. And then Allah lists all of their demands in Surah Al-Isra, several ayat, one after the other. They said, we won't believe in you until this, until that. All of them, all of these demands were evidence that they could see with their eyes. But these people, are they actually looking for evidence? Or was it just an excuse for their kufr? We find that it was just an excuse for their kufr. And so even if these evidences came, they still wouldn't believe. They still wouldn't believe. An example of that is, in fact, these ayat in Surah Al-Isra, one of the kufar of Quraysh, he said, I won't believe until you, O Muhammad, build a staircase going up to the heavens, and then, not only that, but I want you to bring a letter signed by Allah. Bring it, show it to us. And then he said, you know what? Even if you were to do that, I still wouldn't believe in you. Right? So, it shows us that it was just stubbornness. They didn't want to believe. They had already made up their mind. It wasn't about evidence. It's just about being stubborn. And so if that is how the kuffar of Quraysh were in the past, and that is how the follower, the, the people, the kuffar dealt with the other prophets before him, then the kuffar of today are no different. This is something we have to understand. 
that many kuffar who you try to give da'wah to and you find a closed door, you're not able to get through to them, it's because they've already made up their mind. They're not looking for evidence. These are merely excuses to remain upon their kufr. And that's why Allah tells us that even if He was to send a book because the Qur'an came as a revelation from Allah the spoken word of Allah, right? It didn't come down as a physical, material book that you can touch. Allah tells us that if He was to do that they still wouldn't believe. وَلَوْ نَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ كِتَابًا فِي قِرْطَاسٍ فَلَمَسُوهُ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ لَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Had we sent down to you a revelation in writing and they were able to touch it with their hands, the kuffar would have said, this is nothing but pure magic. This is nothing but pure magic. And so, The question is, why did Allah not send us material evidence to prove His existence, to prove the truth of the, of the Prophet Wasallam? Why? Okay, we'll get to that, but we're talking about direct observable evidence. For example, why hasn't Allah shown us? You know, this is the claim of the atheists. They say, I'll believe if I can see God. Otherwise, I won't believe. What is the test? Uh, I have to answer. Number one, is, first of all, we can't see God. Secondly, it's a test. Okay, we mentioned that earlier, yes? Uh, Allah knows that even if He, if he do the, does that, He does not be, still believe. Okay. And there was someone here? It's part of the test. Yeah, it's part of the test. Basically, these answers won't be convincing for them. So this is what you say. You say the answer is very simple. You know, if they say, I want to see God, otherwise I won't believe. You say to them, we human beings have been made to be distinct and unique from all other creatures out there. What is it that makes us unique from animals? Hmm? Yes, and? And our intellect, right? Our intellect and our free will. And so if Allah's existence was to be observable and based on observable evidence such that we can see Allah directly, there would be no longer any function for our intellect and free will. Right? If Allah's existence was based on observable evidence, there would no longer be any function for our intellect and free will. That's it. We wouldn't have any choice. We would then be forced to believe. That's it. No more free will. Right? Because seeing something is not like being told about it. So Allah has given us the, this free will to choose to either believe or not to believe. And as we mentioned earlier, it's the very test of the believers. Those who believe in the unseen. And this is exactly why it's too late to believe or to repent at the moment of death. You know, why has Allah told us that at that moment it's too late? Why? Because at that moment the person is seeing the angels, right? Coming to take away his souls. He now sees with his own eyes what he had disbelieved in all his life. While he had the free will to believe. Right? Now he doesn't have that free will. Now he's going to believe it whether he likes it or not. Right? 
And so that's it. It's too late. The time of the test was before death. Now it's too late. The test is over. And so this is why Allah did not send this kind of direct, observable evidence to prove the world of the unseen. And so this now brings us to the point of what exactly is meant by evidence or how do you arrive at the conclusion that something is true? What is considered knowledge? And this is what they call epistemology or the theory of knowledge and realities. And so, those who believe that the only way at arriving at any truth is through the scientific method, they are in reality believers in what is known as scientism. Scientism is the belief that something is real only if it can be proven scientifically. And many atheists, you know, they, they, they are believers in scientism, even though, you know, they, they, they claim not to be. And so naturally, such a person does not believe in anything called the world of the unseen. Or as they refer to, the metaphysical. So you have the physical world, which is this material world and then metaphysical is the non-material world basically that we cannot see that we cannot sense with our human senses which we refer to as al-ghayb which we Muslims refer to as al-ghayb to the point where some of these atheists are even trying to prove things scientifically from the world of the unseen from the metaphysical world you know they're so stubborn that they just cannot admit that these things cannot be proven through science but they know that these things exist they can't deny it such as our human conscious our human soul the ruh they know these things exist, but they can't prove it scientifically, and so now they're trying to do that. They're trying to find ways to prove it scientifically. And so basically, these people want to replace religion with science. They want to replace religion with science. And that's why, you know, this religion we can say is called scientism. So, how can we prove that realities and truths can be proven through other than the scientific method? Basically, even many Western scientists and philosophers agree that science is limited to the observable world. These are non-atheists. Many Western scientists and philosophers, they agree that science is limited to only the observable world that we live in and other realities rely on other sources of knowledge other than science for example history is a field of knowledge history does not rely on observable evidence okay not solely yes in certain cases you know for example they find uh, they, they find a city that was buried for centuries or thousands of years and they unearth it okay this is evidence that there was a city here but in many cases history relies on narrations and reports not on hard material evidence for example 
Historians don't ask for the body of Alexander the Great to prove that this was a man who existed in history. Right? What do they rely on to prove his existence, that he existed in some point in history? Stories. Stories. Narrations. They don't rely on pictures and videos to prove that he existed. They rely on reports and narrations. And so this is how you prove to this atheist that, look, science is not the only way of proving truths and realities. So yes, we Muslims agree. There are certain things proven through science. But other things are not proven through science. They are proven through narrations, reports. Other things are proven through logic. Right? And that's why Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, the ways at arriving at knowledge are three. How do we conclude the truth of something? Through three ways. The first is observation, al-his. The second is the intellect, al-aql. And the third, he says, is a combination of the two, and that is al-shahada, or testimony, which is basically narration. Someone testified to a certain truth, and so he narrated it. He goes on to say, So there are certain things that cannot be known except through testimony. Like everything that a person knows through testimonies of trustworthy people, like a report that is narrated by multiple narrations, and also what is known through the testimony of the prophets. So how do we prove what the prophets said through this third, through this third way of arriving at the truth, which is a shahada, testimony, or narration. And so whatever we know about Allah or the world of the unseen is based on evidence. Don't let the atheist to fool you, to make you think that your belief in Allah or in the world of the unseen is not based on evidence. It is based on evidence but not scientific evidence. That's what we have to clear here. We have to clear the reality here that science is not the only evidence. There are other evidences and we base our Iman on evidence. And so this is how we respond to the atheists. We say, just because we cannot prove something that is unobservable through the scientific method, it doesn't automatically mean that it doesn't exist. Because this is their principle, this is their qaida that they have based their whole belief upon. Their whole foundation for their kufr is that since I can't prove something through observation, therefore it doesn't exist. And so we say just because we cannot prove something unobservable through the scientific method, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The only thing that it does prove is what? That we cannot arrive at the conclusion that it is true, that it is true through what? Through the scientific method. That's all that this proves. That's all that it proves. Therefore, there must be another source that leads us to know what exists beyond this material, observable world. And that is where the role of what comes into play? Hmm? al fitra who else? al wahi Yes, fitrah is definitely a proof. 
But there are certain things that the fitra can't prove. And that's where we need the wahi, the revelation. And we're going to talk more about this now. And so, if we were to think about everything that exists, we can say that it comes under two categories. Everything that exists can be divided into two categories. Number one, what is observable by our human senses, which is this physical, material world that we live in. Number two, what is not observable by our human senses, which is the unseen world, the ghaib. Okay? So everything that exists falls into one of these two categories. What we can observe, which is this physical material world we live in, and what we cannot observe, which is the unseen world. Now this second category is further divided into two. The first is what can be proven by the human intellect. And the second is what cannot be proven by the human intellect, but rather by al-wahi, by revelation. Okay? So everyone's with me? The second, which is the unseen world, is further divided into two. Number one, that which can be proven by the aql, by the human intellect. And number two, what cannot be proven by the human intellect, but rather by the wahi, the revelation. Okay, so an example of the first, Now, when I say it can be proven by the human intellect, what I mean by that is the general idea that this exists, not the details of it. Okay? Because that is where we come into the second one, which is only proven through the wahi. So, what's an example of that which can be proven by the aql and it's part of the world of the unseen? Okay, anyone else? Mm -mm. Okay, that's a proof of what? No, that is a, yeah, that is a proof of what? Of what? So Allah. So this is the example. Allah can be proven by the intellect. Allah's existence can be proven by the intellect. Right? Even if you don't have wahi, Allah's existence can be proven by the intellect. Okay? But an example of the second, which cannot be proven by the human intellect, but rather only by revelation, is, for example, Yeah, so the attributes of Allah. And what else? Everything. Malaika, Al Jannah, Al Nar, what will happen on the Day of Judgment. None of this can we figure out through our human intellect. We have to have Allah telling us about it. Okay? Okay, now let's look at these two things that we mentioned. So we said, the unseen world, we have one kind that is proven through the intellect, and we have the second kind that is proven through the revelation. Okay, the first kind, when we say that it can be proven by the intellect, we don't mean it is proven directly by the human intellect without an intermediary. Right? So, 
you cannot say that Allah exists just from your human intellect but rather something led you to that something in between right what is that hmm no his signs so the observable world around us right so it is through the traces which are, which are observable connecting us to that unseen thing and that being Allah in this case right also miracles miracles comes under this category you see a miracle happening in front of your eyes you observe it right it's part of this observable universe connecting you to to prove what exists in the unseen right and that is Allah so you say this didn't happen on its own the universe didn't come out didn't just pop out out of nowhere on its own every cause has a reason behind it even if they were to say that there is the big bang that is what we can trace back the universe to okay ask them who caused the big bang you know logic dictates that nothing happens on its own there has to be a cause an original cause so the point here is that the first it is proven through something in between in between us so the traces that are observable Okay, as for the second category, what cannot be proven by the human intellect, but rather by revelation. Here we say that it can't be proven by the intellect alone, because that intermediary is missing. Right? That middle thing there is missing, connecting us to what is unseen so in the case of our belief in Allah it can be proven through the intellect based on that intermediary between us and proving Allah's existence and that is the, what we observe around us but in the case of the second that's missing so the existence of Jannah the existence of Hellfire is there something in this world that we can observe that proves these things exist? No. No. So that's why we say here there's no there's no room for that uh, the aql, the human intellect. Here we need nothing but the wahi, the revelation. The same thing can be said about Allah's attributes, some of them, not all of them. So for example, Allah's attribute of rahmah we see Allah's rahmah around us, it can be observed. Therefore, we conclude Allah is the most merciful. Okay, but certain other attributes, like Allah having a hand, Allah having eyes, rising above the throne, there's no room for the intellect here. Right? Also, Allah's throne, you know, the existence that there is a throne, or the kursi. Right? All of these can only be proven through the revelation. So this is why we need wahi. We need revelation to tell us about these tru truths. And so once we understand this, we see the importance of revelation as a valid source of evidence. And once again, just because we cannot physically and scientifically prove the existence of the revelation of the wahi, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen or that it doesn't exist. Right? Why? What did we say? Because when you reach this point in your debate with a, an atheist, he'll say, okay, prove to me that 
the wahi is true that an angel comes to the prophet and gives him the revelation he says prove it to me now when he says prove it to me what does he mean scientific, scientific evidence you know again his his mind is wired just on that he can't imagine there being any other way to prove any truth and we've already refuted that idea so we say the way to prove the truth of the wahi is not through the scientific method but rather by looking at how true the claim of the prophet is when he claims to receive revelation from Allah the way to prove the truth of any wahi is not through the scientific method but rather by looking at how true the claim of the Prophet is any Prophet of Allah by looking at how true his claim to being a Prophet is when he claims that I receive wahi from Allah and so we look at the evidences of his Prophethood so now in your debate with the atheist you come to proving that Muhammad was indeed a prophet of Allah so this is where you bring logical proof as well as observable proof and that is miracles right miracles but one of the most strongest evidences of the prophethood is what exactly his personal integrity his life before becoming a prophet how was he known by his people he was known as being trustworthy he was known as being truthful in everything that he would ever say throughout his life and so whenever we prove the truthfulness of a prophet it necessitates by default that he is truthful in his claim that he receives wahi from Allah and this was attested to by who? his own people and an example of that yeah his, his own enemies Give me an example. Okay. No, that's no. That's not uh, an authentic story. No. Uh, give me an example of how his own enemies attested to him being truthful was it um, either uh, Abu Sufyan or Abbas when they were talking to Heraclius? yes when Quraysh went to Asham to Syria once it was much later in the prophethood in you know uh, in the Medina period of the Dawah and the Emperor of Rome, Heraclius, he heard about Muhammad Sallallahu and he now finds out that there is a caravan that is here from Quraysh, from his own people. He wanted to meet them. He wanted to take this opportunity to see, you know, wh wh what is this man all about? And so he asked them certain questions. And Abu Sufyan was the one answering. So he asked certain questions just to see, you know, is this really a prophet? And the questions were based on his knowledge, based on scripture of what a prophet is and what a prophet isn't, right? So among the questions that he asked them is, has he ever known to lie? 
has he ever known to be a liar? And so at the end of the story, after he got his answers, he said to Quraysh that I ask you, I asked you such and such question to know such and such. Then when he came to this part, he said, I asked you if he was ever known to lie, and you answered no. And so I knew right away that he must be a prophet because if he didn't tell a lie throughout his life before prophethood, then why would he now come 40 years later and tell the biggest lie? And that is that he receives wahi from Allah. And so once you prove this about the Prophet wasallam, you've proved that whatever he says about Allah must be true. And so from all of this we see how the wahi, the revelation is a valid and true source of evidence to prove anything related to the world of the unseen. And that believing in the world of the unseen when based on authentic revelation is not based on blind faith as the atheists claim. Right? Or on our emotions. You know, it's the fact that we are convinced the fact that we are convinced that this is actually the words of Allah. So we are convinced based on evidence. Don't let, again, again, don't let the atheists to confuse you, to fool you, into thinking that your iman and your belief is based on blind following and blind faith. Of the future? Yeah, that, that's also among the evidences that prove that he was a prophet from Allah. The fact that certain things he informed would happen and they happen exactly how uh, he had informed. And so based on all of this, we see how evidence is more than just some physical, observable data that proves the existence of things beyond this material world. And so it cannot rely on science because it is outside of the realm of science. Okay. Simply put, proving the world of the unseen cannot rely on the scientific method because it doesn't fall within the realm, the study of, of the scientific method. However, a, a question that we can conclude with here is how did we arrive at this situation where we are being demanded to prove what is not observable through science? Mm -hmm. And what caused that? <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Of course, that goes without saying. Anyone else? Exactly. Yes, we Muslims played a huge role in advancing science, but our Muslim scientists, they didn't deal with science in this way. They didn't consider the scientific method to be the only way of proving truths, right? This happened in European society. And so we have to go back hundreds of years to the Reformation age in Europe when Western society wanted to free itself from the clutches of the church, the suppression of the church and the religious elite who would enforce their views on everyone even if it went against new scientific discoveries. You know, as 
Europe started to advance scientifically, right? There was a collision course between science and those who were holding on to power, and that was the church. And so these new scientific discoveries are being made, but the church is holding on to, you know, their beliefs, and they're not accepting many of these scientific discoveries. For example, when Galileo discovered the roundness of the earth and how the earth rotates around the sun, etc., he was persecuted. He was told not to publish his conclusions. He wasn't allowed to publish his book on that. Right? So, they wanted to free themselves from this suppression of the church. And so what did they do? Once they freed themselves from the authority of the church, they decided to completely disregard anything that religion teaches until we can prove it scientifically. So they went to the other extreme. Right? And this is where a transformation happened where society started looking at everything that is claimed to be true that it must be proven scientifically. Especially when religious texts contradict many of these new scientific findings. This was in the late 1700s and into the 1800s in Europe. So this is where they threw religion and scripture out of being considered a source of knowledge and evidence for anything. On the other hand, if we come to the Islamic concept for proving what exists beyond this material world, we find that Islam emphasizes on one thing. What is that? Okay. No, what did we just say? That what, what, what do we what do we rely on to prove the world of the unseen? Wahi. But not just Wahi. We find that Islam in emphasizes on the importance of what? Of what kind of Wahi? Authentic. Islam emphasizes on the authenticity of the revelation. And that's the difference between us and them. Western society, they want to reform Islam just like they reformed Christianity. And they're pushing for this in the Muslim world. Right? They're pushing for this. They're saying, look, you guys are 300 years behind us. Look at how we freed ourselves from the church and the religious elite. You guys have to do the same thing. But what's the difference between us and them? A huge difference. Their knowledge of the world relied on corrupt revelation. Right? Their religious elite are saying we have to stick to the wahi. We Muslims agree. But the difference between us and them is that their wahi is corrupt. And ours isn't. That's the difference. That's the basic underlying difference. And so we emphasize, you know, Islam emphasizes on how the revelation cannot have any distortions. It cannot have any inconsistencies in its narration to us. And so from this we can see the huge difference between Islam and all other religions in how we prove what we believe in.
unfortunately, the atheists, they look at us like they look at Christians. But this is where we have to, you know, clarify this misconception for them. We have to tell them, look, we're not like them. In fact, we're not like no other religion on the face of this earth. All these other religions rely on corrupt sources, fabrications, false narrations, even things that go against basic and sound intellect. Whereas what we believe in does not go against sound and you know, uh, sound and authentic information and the intellect. And so, what we believe in about the world of the unseen, no one knows it except Allah. Therefore, our Iman in the Ghaib is based on information from Allah. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عالم الغيب فلا يظهر على غيبه أحدا إلا من اتضى من رسول He is the knower of the unseen disclosing none of it to anyone He doesn't disclose any of the unseen to anyone إلا except whom he has approved of messengers So this shows us that the ghayb, its knowledge is only with Allah. But he does disclose it to us through the messengers, through wahi basically. And so this proves that knowledge of the unseen is something exclusively for Allah that no created being can have knowledge of except through him, except through Allah. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a clear warning to his own prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if he dares to make up anything from his own self he would destroy him and this was a refutation of Quraysh who claimed that Muhammad is making up stuff and so Allah refutes them Allah says وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَوِيلِ if he was to make up on his own and attribute it to Allah, he would have certainly seized him. We would have taken him by the right hand. Then we would have severed his aorta, that vein, which is basically the largest artery of the body, uh, carrying blood from the heart to the circulatory system. Allah says, فَمَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ عَنْهُ حَاجِزِينَ And none of you would have been able to shield him from us. So, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a clear warning to the Prophet sallallahu that if he was to try to make up something and attribute it to Allah without knowledge, without wahi, you know, he would uh, end his life. Proving that whatever he sallallahu alayhi wa brought to us that can be authentically attributed to him is based on the pure wahi that has not been altered, that has not been distorted. And so all this proves the Islamic concept of proving our beliefs related to the unseen and that proving these things is linked to the wahi whose authenticity we can prove. You know, it's not that we just believe in it, right? No, we believe in it for a reason. And that's because it can be proven. And so the Islamic take on this issue is different from all other religions that do not make the established authentic revelation a source for proving religious beliefs related to the unseen. Rather, those beliefs of theirs are proven by sources other than the revelation that are not based on evidence proving their validity. And so I'll just conclude with a summary of what we discussed today. A summary of the points. Number one, un 
unseen things can be proven by showing that the sources of knowledge are not limited to the observable or scientific method but rather some knowledge can be proven through other sources number two the only way to reach knowledge of the unseen must be through authentic revelation as it is not possible to reach the knowledge of the existence of these unseen things except through that method number three the logical evidence for the truthfulness of the one who claims to be getting the wahi is his truthfulness and that's the logical evidence prove that he's true therefore whatever he claims must be true prove that Muhammad is you know his claim to be a prophet is true therefore whatever he tells us now we submit to him right and that's why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu When the Prophet وسلم, went on Al Isra Wal Mi'raj on the night journey and he ascended up to the heavens and he came back in the same night and the next morning you know news started to spread of what happened and it caused the iman of some of them to shake because this was a miraculous event that no one can do, right? In scientific terms. No one can do that even today. So, you know, some of the kuffar of Quraysh, they came to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And they asked him, do you know what your companion is saying? He said, no. They told him. And he said, of course I believe in what he's saying. He didn't have a shadow of doubt. He didn't shake his iman. They said, how can you believe that? He said, لَإِنْ قَالَهَا فَقَدْ صدق. As long as he said it, then he has spoken the truth. Does this mean Abu Bakr was a blind follower? No, why? What did he say? He said, if he said it, it must be true. What does that tell you? Exactly. If he said it, meaning if anyone else said it, I wouldn't believe in it. But since he is the one who is saying it, I believe in it without any hesitation because he is the one who is saying it and I already know that whatever he says must be true based on the evidences of his prophethood. And that's how we, we, we have to build our aqidah and our iman. Whenever we hear something from the Prophet wasallam, don't object to it. Don't think, okay, that doesn't make sense to me. This seems to go against what we're learning about science today. No. Submit. Like Abu Bakr and the companion submitted. Number four. Differentiating between the different claims for the existence of the unseen. Each claim and its basis must be examined. Whoever claims that something exists in the world of the unseen, bring it. Let's look at the evidence. And this goes even for us Muslims. Right? We're talking about the difference between Islam and other religions. But this also includes you know, the different sects within Islam who claim different things about the world of the unseen. And this should even, you know, strengthen our position in front of the kuffar. When we tell them, you know, even within our own religion, we don't accept everything that is claimed. We scrutinize it. We ask, what is the evidence? If the evidence is weak, a weak hadith, we don't accept it. Right? All of this shows that, you know, we rely on 
authentic evidence as opposed to those who don't. And so no belief concerning the world of the unseen can be affirmed except after it has been proven through the authentic revelation. And when we say revelation al-wahi, what do we mean? Not just the Qur'an, but also the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is also wahi. The authentic hadith. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us beneficial knowledge and to strengthen our iman. صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. If there's any questions. We say first of all, we say first of all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He decides. He decides without asking anyone. He doesn't take anyone's permission to, you know, choose a messenger. Right? Allah yajtabi man yasha'u Allah yajtabi man yasha'u min rusulihi yajtabi min rusulihi man yasha'u Allah chooses whomever he wills from to be a messenger you know, so it goes back to the will of Allah this is what we say first of all that the Muslim he submits to that he doesn't ask why number one number two if a non-Muslim is asking this then we would answer differently and so we would say that Generally speaking, the prophets came from that area, the Middle East, Palestine, etc. Ibrahim was from Iraq, because that was the center of civilization in the past. And so, that is from where everything will spread. Right? So China is considered the Far East, this area is considered the Far West, and so that was, and still is until today, a very central uh, location. Number three, we can say that the prophets were coming in succession one after the other in the area of Palestine and it was coming through the line of Ishaq. And so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed that line to be from Ismail. And so the prophets were going to remain from the descendants of Ibrahim salam. This was Allah's choice once again. That he would make him to be the father of all the prophets. Again, it was his choice. And so all the prophets came through him. First it was coming one after the other through Bani Israel. Then after they showed that they were not fit for this status of allowing the prophethood to remain among them. After they showed through their stubbornness and through their kufr, then Allah changed it to be from the line of Ismail. I mentioned that that was a central area of the world and so it's easy to spread the message from there and that's exactly what happened after the death of the Prophet وسلم, that Islam spread east and west easily you know if it was from the far east it would be difficult to reach the far west right it would take ages before they reach all, all the way to the end of the world but when you're in the middle you can easily go east and west
so then it's not because they're trying to juxtapose the question and say, oh, why did they only receive revelation and why did they only receive prophets? But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also says that every nation received uh, messengers. But yeah. Yeah. yeah, every single nation received a prophet, as Allah mentions in the Quran. Uh, that was uh, he was a prophet for that people. Any other questions? It's not really more of a question, but it's more of like something to say, you know? So when atheist comes up with the point of the Big Bang, you could just say, like, who instilled the laws of the universe? Like, the law of attraction, the law of death, and the law of all this stuff. Like, who instilled the laws, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it all goes back to there being an original cause. Nothing happens on its own, including these laws. عالم الغيب. Yeah. Allah knows best. Any other questions? Okay, we'll conclude with that. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, two small announcements. Uh, one, for all the brothers that have paid, please see Brother Ismir in the back in the black hoodie and register with him so that he'll have your information. So that's for all the brothers that have paid to join the institute. Please see Brother Ismir in the back. Secondly, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, uh, he will be speaking next instead of Sheikh Karim as scheduled until uh, I believe 2.20 or 2 p.m. I'm not sure. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we will resume in five minutes at twelve thirty five.
Sheikh, I want to ask something regarding certain ayah. Mm. Okay, and uh, this is used in fiqh, um, but the ayah about Khama uh, being a religious sweat. Mm. So, I know in fiqh, they, in certain um, rulings, they say that it's based on this, it's mm. najis. So, I want to know, like, what is the correct opinion on this matter? Like, what is the most... Well, like, Jumhur, Ramah. That it's physically Jumu'ah, the majority. But the other opinion is very strong too. That's like some of the contemporary scholars, Sheikh Mu'tamin, for example, used to take the other one. And others in which they say what's meant in the verse is a non physical impurity. Because in the verse in the Muhammad, or Maysir, or Ansab, or Islam, or Maysir gambling is not physically impure. It's like, you touch cards, you're not. Gonna... Right. So it, it's depends, subhanAllah, the. Those who said that it's physically impure, they said this is what the original ruling of everything. And then what's non-physical, we take it out of the as an exception. The others, they said no, it's the other way around. Everything is meant here is non-physical purity except what's mentioned. So this is what difference of opinion. That's why the matter yani, is easy, Allah. If someone wants to leave it, mashallah, sure. But if someone wants to use it, I personally take the pain that it's not impure. Right. Yeah, because of the evidence is not very clear. Right, right, right. Uh, because I really wanted the clarification on right. that one. Because sometimes you hear right. both sides of the argument. So, Sheikh, one more thing. Like, so I follow your YouTube series. Oh, Alhamdulillah, I've been right. a lot. I don't know if you know, but a lot of your right. stuff is in SoundCloud as well. Oh, I think some brothers know. from Russia, I believe, they uploaded a lot of your like. One thing I was gonna ask you, Sheikh, what tips here do you recommend, like? Like beside, obviously, we benefit from you, but up, up, like in terms of reading. Uh, in Arabic or in English, because English, it, English is it depends on what's translated. That's the thing. Like Tafsir al Kathir, of course, it's translated, even so it's a summarized version. Tafsir al Sari, they just finished that, I believe. Yeah, they just translated. Anything else? I'm not sure if there's anything good that is translated as far as the books of Tafsir. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes the English issue limited. So, but then, of course, with the Arabic, there are so many schools. Right, right. And the best thing for the Fasir, you know, if a person is a, is a beginner, to take one you know, short Fasir to finish it all together first. Whether even if the, the Kathir is considered to be like that, you go from the beginning to the end in a very precise time. And then after that, it, you don't limit yourself to one book. Every verse, you look at the tens of books of the Fasir and see what the they say. And, some of it is more specialized into fiqh matters, right. versus linguistics. But then you have to be careful because most of the tafsir are written by the, the people with the Ahl Kalam. Right, that's, that's what I was going to say. Like, right. There's a, right now there's there's a, it's a Makhshari, it's a beautiful tafsir, right. linguistically. But uh, it's a is a Mu'tazi. Yeah. He is, yeah, the, the, play, the book has so much crazy stuff in it. Oh, but right. that's why a person has to reach a certain level where he can extract the benefits and stay away from the same thing with the Tafsir of Akhrati al-Arazi. Yes, yeah, it's full of crazy stuff. But has some meaning, amazing stuff. Wow, right, right, right. Because he was, people say he was an intelligent man, but he was, yes. it's, he was just... This is the nature of the time. Things right. were, they were facing the reality of their, of their time. But yes, he has some amazing intellectual things in Tafsir that is... But like I, I would never. Uh, <laughs> not, not in the beginning. Yeah, not in the level. Once you master the aqidah of the salaf, it's beautiful. Salaf, salaf, salaf. Amir, inshallah. Amir, Allah, Aiza. You better start right now. Yes, inshallah. There's a question. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم This lecture إن شاء الله تعالى is about the I'm just trying to see the title here 
Okay, this is not the one, but it's about the Dajjal. The signs of the hour, and one of the biggest signs of the hour, the fitna of Ad Dajjal. And then the next session, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about the coming of Isa ibn Waryam. Uh, the subject of the signs of the hour, and assuming that you guys have been following what has been mentioned before, so that I don't repeat it over again, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there is fiqh in it. We have to understand it in the right way, because this is according to what happened to the Muslim Ummah through centuries. Many people deviated. Many people, they did miserable things as a result of not understanding the fiqh, the proper understanding and dealing with these signs of the hour. And I would start with this and with a statement by one of the early generations of Islam, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, when he said, uh, the meanings of which, if the Dajjal comes out, I'm sorry, if the Mahdi comes out, if the Mahdi comes out, فَكُنْ آخِرْ مَنْ يُبَيِّعُ Be the last person to go give him the pledge. The Mahdi is coming. No doubt about this in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ are abundance. But when it comes to the signs of the hour, there's no actions required from your side. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed. And there's no actions from the ummah to establish individually or collectively to bring any of these signs of the hour. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed and it's going to happen. And subhanAllah, the fiqh of Imam Sufyan al-Thawri as a result of this is because how many throughout history of Muslims they claimed falsely to be the Mahdi and then people followed them blindly and they end up, you know, even many of them were killed and things of that nature. So that's why before all these fitan happened, he said, be the last one to give him the pledge because you're not addressed by the revelation from Allah that you need to do anything. It's going to happen. So this is an important concept to understand when it comes to the signs of the hour. Human beings are fascinated with what's going to come ahead and things like this. And that's why they like to hear stories and details and how this is going to look like and how people will be like this. But we as we have to follow the proper methodology in things, we follow the wahi from Allah, the revelation from Allah. So these sessions, inshallah ta'ala, is not going to be necessarily stories and how, what's going to happen before what, but rather to deal with it the way the Prophet ﷺ did to the companions of the Allah and to the Ummah, and one of which is Fitnat al-Dajjal. He warned والسلام, this Ummah from al-Dajjal in many, many hadith, very clear hadith, and there is no doubt of its authenticity whatsoever, of course, and that's why those who deny this or alter its meanings, they are deviants. And uh, because of that, uh, there is no prophet, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, there is no prophet unless he warned his people from al Masih al Dajjal. And the Prophet ﷺ being the last of the messengers, and he said, that he will come out in your time, meaning in the time of this Ummah. There's no more messengers to come. So definitely is coming. And the Prophet ﷺ himself did not know when the Dajjal will come. But some of the signs that are mentioned in the hadith, and that's why inshallah ta'ala will spend some time in, in uh, understanding some of these hadith when it comes to the Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And part of that is to uh, establish something in the deen. And as even one of the signs of the Dajjal, that he would come at a time when people are not talking about him. So that means people need to constantly warn against the Dajjal. And even if a person lived and died and he did not witness this biggest fitna ever to be observed uh, on the face of earth, there is benefits in knowing the seeds of this fitna so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and everybody will be tried anyway. If it's not in this life, in the graves and things like this. So there's no way to run away from being tried. So that's why we need to seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Prophet والسلام, said about the fitna of Al-Qabr. He said والسلام, Allah, ilay, Allah inspired, revealed to me أَنَّكُمْ تُفْتَنُونَ فِي قُبُورِكُمْ That you will be tried in your graves قَرِيبًا أَوْ مِثْلْ فِتْنَةِ الدَّجَّلِ Close to or the like of the fitna of the Dajjal. That means everybody will be tried. Some people will be saved from this of course, not even facing the trials. And that's why, as it will be mentioned, the means to protect ourselves from the fitna of the Dajjal 
is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be among al-Iman yuthabbitu Allah al-lazina amanu bil qawli thabiti fil hayati dunya wa fil akhir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that fastness to the believers and part of that is to be obedient to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in everything that he said alayhi wa sallatu wa sallam without putting forward our own reasoning of things you have wahi revelation and we'll understand the, the meaning of this inshallah ta'ala in some of these ahadith first of all the Prophet والسلام, said that I would, because of the time will be brief, I won't mention all the details of the hadith and the takhreej of it and the narrators and so on, but quoting the shahid or the point of reference from the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, and for the rest of, inshallah, what's in the book for you to study, inshallah ta'ala. Hadith of the Prophet ما بين خلق آدم إلى قيام الساعة خلق أكبر من الدجال. There is nothing from the time of Adam السلام, till the day of judgment, a greater uh, thing that or event that would happen greater than the Dajjal or Amrun Akbaru min al-Dajjal a matter that is greater than the Dajjal so this is again the first point here this is the biggest fitna that would ever afflict the human beings and if we understand the concept and the meanings of fitan fitna is not about physical destruction of the people the fitna is when it comes to the purpose of this life that many people will end up being in the hellfire because of the Dajjal, because of the fitan. That's what the fitan does. Fitan is not about people dying or people suffering from poverty or whatever there is. If they are upon Al Iman or Taqwa, they are not afflicted by the fitna. The fitna is a trial to one's Iman. And that's why this is a fitna that the Dajjal he comes and he claims to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the Dajjal who is going to claim about himself. And amazingly, most of the human beings, they would follow him. Because they don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet, والسلام, he said, Inni la I am warning you from the Dajjal. La unthirukumu, the ha at the end refers to the Dajjal. Right? I am warning you, after he mentioned the Dajjal, والسلام, he said, I am warning you against him. وَمَا مِن نَبِيٍ إِلَّا أَنذَرَ قَوْمَ and there is no prophet unless he warned his people. But then he said, وَلَكِنِّي سَأَقُولُ لَكُمْ فِيهِ قَوْلًا I will say, mention something about the Dajjal that لَمْ يَقُولُهُ نَبِيٌّ لِقَوْمِ No prophet had said that to his people before. So this is unique to this ummah. And that's why those who listen and apply this, they will be saved by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّهُ أَعْوَرْ وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرْ That he is أَعْوَرْ أَعْوَرْ is someone that has bad eye, one bad eye, uh, not one eyed, that he has two eyes but one is bad. Uh, Allah is not awar. And always the ulama when they mention this, they see they say how much important it is for the people to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way. Those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way with his names and attributes, we say shay, nothing is the like of Allah. So when, and, and part of that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the perfect names and attributes. Imagine someone comes with a bad eye and he's claiming to be the Lord of the Alameen and most of the people would follow him because he's doing things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do. He ordered the skies to rain and it rains, order the earth to bring its treasures and it does. Whoever follows him, they become in prosperity and richness and all kinds of things. And those who do not follow him, he leaves them in poverty and misery. So the hearts when it's attached to the dunya, you know, it's the deal is to follow the Dajjal. But then the end result of this is an everlasting punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the benefit of learning the names and attributes of Allah and the aqeedah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect and nothing is the like of Allah. But then what the Prophet والسلام, he said that the prophets before did not mention, وَإِنَّ بَيْنَ عَيْنَيْهِ مَكْتُوبٌ كَافِرٌ Between his eyes is written kafir. Or in some of the narrations, kaf, fa, ra. Yaqra'u kullu mu'min. Every believer would read it, even if he's illiterate. Even if you don't know Arabic. If a person is a believer, he will see that between the two eyes of a dajjal Is it physically written like this? Yes. We don't distort the meanings of it. It's not something metaphoric. It's not something uh, you would feel it. Maktubun bayna aynayhi. Written between his two eyes. Kafara, only the believers would read it, even if they're not able to read or they literate, they don't read. So this is 
uh, something there. There's uh, many hadith that talks about the Dajjal, by the way. And the Prophet ﷺ has mentioned in, in some of the hadith that he would speak to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum for a long period of time. One of which is that he prayed Fajr والسلام, and he addressed the people till Salat al -Dhuhr. And then he prayed Dhuhr and then he got up on the member again and he addressed the people till Asr. And from after Asr till Maghrib, the entire day. And he told them والسلام, about every ma huwa kainun, what's going to happen till the day of judgment. Every single detail of what's going to happen to the day of judgment. Some people by the power and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they uh, retain that and some by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they made to forget for a reason so whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for this ummah to and anything that the Prophet said is preserved for this ummah when it comes to matters of the deen to protect the deen of the ummah of the Prophet uh, one of these hadith that there will be some form of drought and things like that before him and uh, in, in a long hadith uh, and then what the Prophet وسلم, said when he mentioned these things one year after the other uh, someone asked the Prophet وسلم, فما يعيش الناس في ذلك الزمان? what would sustain the life of the people when there's drought and hunger and so on he said التهليل والتكبير والتحميد saying لا إله إلا الله الله أكبر والحمد لله and that will be sufficient for them as the Prophet وسلم, said well, of course, there's a relationship between a dhikr and a rizq and the provisions from Allah. And this hadith in Surah the Majah and others, and it's a sound hadith. Uh, as we heard, the, some of the characteristics of the Dajjal that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, that he is short, that he is jad, his hair is, uh, is wavy or uh, rough, his a'war, matmusul ayn, his eye is uh, wiped, uh, that uh, and then he said والسلام, which is a very amazing uh, when you read the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, every word of course it's meant to be there with, with these clear signs that when you're sitting like this and you hear it you think okay that's obvious once the Dajjal comes we know him no problem but still the Prophet والسلام, he said فَإِنْ أُلْبِسَ عَلَيْكُمْ if you get confused of the Dajjal confused this is how the fitna it's the biggest fitna and you see how many fitna we get exposed to and it made you sometimes that you want to follow or following even the fitna so this is the biggest fitna so a person should not feel that he is secure from it it's only by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the Prophet والسلام, he said فَإِنْ أُلْبِسَ عَلَيْكُمْ if it becomes confusing for you فَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرٍ First thing is have the knowledge and that's the knowledge of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The knowledge of the aqeedah that the people would make you turn away from it. Don't learn the names and attributes and all of this. And when it comes to these physical attributes of Allah, oh, there's no such a thing. Have the knowledge that your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not awar, is not one-eyed. Right? So this is clearly for the knowledge of it. وَأَنَّكُمْ لَمْ تَرَوْا رَبَّكُمْ Plus, the second thing is that you would never see your Lord in this dunya. This is a aqeedah. No one will be able to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this life. It's only in the hereafter. The hereafter, the believers will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's the most joyful thing in Jannah. Nothing is more joyful for them than to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this dunya, innaka lan tarani, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said even to Musa alayhi salam, you would never see me in this world. So once a person have this uh, matter of aqidah clear, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him. There is a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that mentions warning against the Dajjal that he is going to go throughout the earth in a very fast pace. As he said والسلام, uh, من بلد إلا الدجال, إلا There is no city or town unless the Dajjal would Yata'uhu, that means he'll walk in it, he'll be in it, except Mecca and Medina. Mecca and Medina are the two cities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them from the Dajjal, but those who are in Mecca and Medina from the hypocrites of this Ummah, the Mecca or Medina will shake and then it will push away the Munafiqeen or the hypocrites and for them to join the Dajjal. But he would not enter physically Mecca or Al Medina. The fitna here and the Prophet did not leave anything that we need unless he warned us against. Uh, one of the 
great fitna that the Dajjal has is that he comes with Jannah and fire. He comes with garden and fire. And this is exactly as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I'm sorry, uh, not Jannah, ma. Inna ma'ahu ma wa nar. Inna ma'ahu ma an wa naran. He comes with water and fire. The two opposites. Water and fire. But then he said, ﷺ, and I want you to pay attention to this, because this is, you know, when you have instructions, uh, everything is by instructions, right? I need to follow the instructions. And they make sure that you follow the instructions and don't outsmart the instructions because you can ruin yourself and others. So follow the instructions. So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَنَارُهُ مَا أُنْبَارِدْ وَمَاءُهُ نَارٌ That uh, the fire with him is cold water. And the water is fire. So, and then he said in that one narration, Sayyid Muslim, فَلَا تَهْلِكُوا don't destroy yourself. Don't ruin yourself. So don't think that the water that he has is water. No, this is fire. And the fire that he has that you see it physically as fire, this is cold water. The second hadith or narration also in Sahih Muslim, which is an amazing one, in, in which he said that you would have two kinds of running rivers. One of it is ma'un abyad, clear white water. And the other one is Ra'ya al -ayn. And the Prophet ﷺ said Ra'ya al -ayn. That means you see it physically with your eyes So that nobody would come later And they still did They say this is also This is something metaphoric Does it really mean water and fire? You're talking about fairy tales here Right? The Prophet ﷺ says Ra'ya al -ayn. You see it with your own eyes No doubt about this whatsoever The other one is fire Narun ta'ajjaj Fire that is very strong Then listen to the instructions if you had to face it, and that also is mentioned in another hadith, we'll go into a different hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ said, إذا سمعت بالدجال, what should you do if you hear about the Dajjal? The Dajjal is out. فَنْأَعَنْهُ فَنْأَعَنْهُ that means run away from him. Be as far as you can from him, which is always the case for the fitan. Fitan, we don't go to it, you run away from it. You will be uh, pushed to get into the fitan and people won't leave you alone why won't you speak about this why don't you speak about the fitan and they want you to speak about it they want you to be part of it and you're a coward if you're not doing this or that so when it comes to the dajjal if you hear about him anhu, stay away from him and then the prophet والسلام, clearly stated that a man would go to him thinking that he knows him because of these hadith for example he knows the dajjal and very soon he would follow him. Yatba'u. From a distance when it's hidden, when he doesn't see him, oh, I know the Dajjal. So let me see this exciting thing. At least I will be written in history that I saw the Dajjal. Right? Then people, they go see him, and then they end up following the Dajjal, which is, So the instruction is, listen to the Prophet ﷺ, and don't judge, don't go by what your judgment is and what you see with your what people are doing. That's the importance of the wahi. My dear brothers and sisters, the, the seriousness of following the wahi before any taste, before any thinking, before anything whatsoever. Uh, but then in going back to that hadith where he says that he has two rivers, if you have to face it, there's no run away from it, then the Prophet ﷺ is saying then go to the one that you see as fire because it's a test that means people are tested you have to go either to the one that is water or the one that is fire so if you had to face this and you could not run away from it go to the one that is fire you see with your own eyes that it's fire you're going with your own self like this choosing to go to the one that is fire and by the mercy of Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed his favor upon us that the Prophet ﷺ says it then what to do then because it's very scary to do this he says well يغمض. when you get when you go to the one that is fire close your eyes because you might be affected by the fitna right close your eyes ثم رأسه. close your eyes and lower your head like this فيشرب منه. then drink from it فإنه ماء بارد it's cold water this is amazing, right? 
This is requires full submission to the wahi. You're going to what you see there is fire. Don't say, well, I know that this is the Jajal, I'll open my eyes. Listen to the instructions. Close your eyes. May Allah protect us from facing these fitan. He says, عَيْنَا To that details the Prophet is saying. Let him close his eyes and lower his head to drink from this what appears to be fire. فَإِنَّهُ مَاءٌ Not just any water even. فَإِنَّهُ مَاءٌ بَارِدْ It's cold water for you to drink. And this is uh, again something that we only get to know from the wahi. And by the way, every, everything that is mentioned about the Dajjal, you would find the resemblance of it as the ulama, they say in this life that we live when it comes to the fitan. That's the biggest fitna. The fitan, even if it's small, it has some things for us to protect ourselves from it, one of which is this. The fitan, people think that this is a good thing. And for the fire of this world is sins and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it tastes good and it looks good, and the, the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the, the most pleasant thing in this life, even if it requires for a person to struggle and to strive. Uh, the fitan that he comes with, and that's why most of the people would follow him. Again, the earth brings its treasures, the, the skies is commanded and it rains when he commands it. The, the, the non-living things would follow him. Right? And uh, he would even, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, that he would come to people فيدعوهم. he will invite them to follow him فيؤمنونه. they will believe in him ويستجيبون له. they follow him فيأمر السماء فتمطر. so he commands the skies to rain والأرض فتنبت. and the earth to bring its plants فتروح عليهم سارحتهم أطول ما كانت ذرا وأسباغ ضروعا and the animals will go and come back full with milk and all kinds of pleasant things in their life. Who on the face of earth would not follow someone like this? And this is the real fitna. If, if you have someone now flying in the air, people would follow him. Imagine someone is like this. And then he said, then he goes to other people and he called them, they would not believe in him. So he leave them and go. They will, in the morning, nothing of their wealth is in their hands nothing they lose everything and this is a test and, and a person to to witness that and he would pass by al kharibah the, the place that people throw the garbage in it and things like this and he would say akhriji kunuzak bring out your treasures so the kunuz or the treasures will follow him like the bees follows him amazing things looks like miraculous things to the people and that's why most of the people they would follow him and that's why it's the biggest fitna that's why the best of all of the shuhada, the martyrs, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, it's a man that he had to face the Dajjal, and he would say that, I know that you are the Dajjal, you are the liar, and the Dajjal will split him into half with a, with a soul, and he would walk between his two parts of his body to show the people that he killed him, and then he bring him back to life. So this believer would say, Wallahi, by Allah, ما ما ازددت فيك إلا يقين and no I I the يقين and the certainty and they believe that you are the liar made me even more because of what you did and then he won't be able the Dajjal won't be able to touch him anymore he he would be deprived from doing this so when you know many things again he comes from a a land as the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام said called Khorasan from the east this is where he comes out first. But his zuhur, his establishment is in between uh, Jordan and Iraq, Asham and Iraq. This is where he is going to first be effective or appear. And he had bought 70,000 from Yahud Asfahan, 70,000 of the Jews in Asfahan would follow him and things of that nature. Uh, the Dajjal and how he covers the entire earth and when uh, the Prophet والسلام, was asked how long he would stay, on the face of earth, he said, Arba'una yawman, 40 days. Yawmun kasana, the first day is like a year, wa yawmun kashahar, and the second day is like a month, and then a day like a week, a jumu'ah, and the rest of the days are like your days. Tfadda. Yes, the Jal's going to come from Khorasan? That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. That means he's not going to be effective there, but this is where he comes out first from. But Zuhuru, that means the He's, he's now to be known 
is in a place between a sham and Iraq. No. Uh, the, the Prophet والسلام, when he mentioned about the 40 days and the first one is like a year, again with this hadith, some people when they say it, meaning it, it feels long. No, but the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they said, فَذَاكَ الْيَوْمُ الَّذِي كَسَنَا It gives us the, the way that the Sahaba understood things. They asked the Prophet وسلم, this day is, the, 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 is like a year. أَتَكْفِينَ فِيهِ صَلَاةُ يَوْمٍ is it sufficient for us to pray the salah of one day or one year? And Shaykh Ibn Uthamir Rahimahullah, I remember when he, when he was explaining this and he says, SubhanAllah, and this is one of the benefits also that the ulama they mentioned about this hadith, is that what concerns the Sahaba the most? They're not dealing about the Dajjal, this and that. Our salah, what are we going to do with the salah in that day that is one year? The most important thing in their life. So the Prophet والسلام, said, La uqdu la uqadra. That means you don't pray the five five prayers only in that one day that is a year. You count for it how many prayers that you would pray in a year. And the Ramah took many benefits from this in these uh, countries where the sun doesn't, doesn't uh, set. How do they pray? qadra. That you uh, basically count how many for every 24 hours you pray basically five prayers. So the five prayers have to be prayed as the Prophet ﷺ said. Uh, at Dajjal again uh, with the many hadith that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned and the time that he would come and he uh, the people or the Muslims will be it seems from the hadith that they would be strong and they were fighting uh, the Romans uh, and uh, the many different details of that with the major things that was, was going to happen as the hadith in Sahih Muslim and then he would come down and, uh, or he would come uh, and the, the people, those who followed the Mahdi would fight the Dajjal and then the next subject when we talk about Isa alayhi salam, he is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make him kill the Dajjal as it will be stated inshallah wa ta'ala but it's very important for us for what is left in the time uh, that we get to understand and to know the means of how to protect ourselves from this fitna and this is really what matters. If we get warned of it, as we heard the Prophet he was not saying stories to the people. And even the Prophet he did not know which one is the Dajjal. And there is the long hadith of hadith of Tamim al-Dari, Sahih Muslim, where the Ramad, they talked about it, and this hadith about Tamim al-Dari and others before they were Muslims, when they were got uh, stranded in, a, in the sea, in the ocean somewhere, and they were on an island, and uh, the beast, Adabba came to them and took them to uh, someone ch in chains inside and he men asked them certain questions as the signs for him to come out and he informed them that he is the Dajjal and the Prophet ﷺ heard this and, and approved for what he heard ﷺ with regards to the Dajjal himself but the ulama they say Allah knows best if this thing that talked to them was a shaitan that is chained from the time of Sulaiman ﷺ or the Dajjal himself because we don't have clear evidence of whether the Dajjal is alive and he is kept somewhere or he will be born as a normal child and even some of the narrations talks about his parents and things like this. So the, this is ilm that is not going to be benefiting for us. Whether to know it or not, it doesn't matter. And that's why what matters is that he is the biggest witness and this is the characteristics of the Dajjal and for us to be warned against it by basically taking the means, general means and specific means as we all know. The general mean is those who will be protected from the fitna of the Dajjal, those who believe and are steadfast upon the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we heard, those who have this following of the way of the Prophet والسلام, in such a way that we, and, and actually really we don't have to be convinced of how to follow the Prophet والسلام, it's from the concept of following itself. Well, what is the meaning of al ittiba'? Al ittiba' is that you follow. Follow meaning if you already made uh, sense to yourself or made reason for yourself, you're not following. It's your decision based on what you think of what yourself is good. But when it comes to following, you're following someone that you don't know where he's taking you. But you know from the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is what is best for you. So following the way the Prophet ﷺ, even in these fitan, you would find some of the brothers, those who might be upon the sunnah and things like this and they still fall into some of the fitan where the Prophet ﷺ warned us against. Whether it's with dealing with the Muslim ummah, the khuruj or revolting and all of these things, it becomes the norm among the people when the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from this. Clearly stated in the hadith, 
You're going to go by reason, it's, it's your way of things, and you see the outcome of it anyway. But if you follow the, the nusus and the text with the understanding of the early generations of Islam, this is the way for a person to be saved. And part of the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to understand how to follow this deen and to humble ourselves because arrogance is not someone that looks in a weird way that he's arrogant. No, a person can look as if he's humble, very humble, looking wise, humbleness is in the heart. He is very humble and he's, mashallah, making ibadah, making dhikr, but he's a deviant. And he has arrogance in his heart because he refused to follow the way the Prophet والسلام, and he follows his desires and the uh, pressures from others and the like of this. We all know the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and others where the Prophet والسلام, would teach the Sahaba, and that's basically the Ummah of the Prophet والسلام, to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from four things after the tashahud and before the salam, and we talked about that before. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adabi jahannam, min adabi qabr, wa min fitnati al-mahya wa al-mamat, wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-dajjal. So five times a day at least if it's the obligatory salah only. Four things, one of which is وَمِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحِ الدَّجَّالِ And before that the fitna of life and the trials of life and the trials of death and from the worst of the fitna of al-masih al-dajjal. So this is something, a physical mean, uh, religiously known to follow, to protect ourselves. Uh, we know the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, to memorize the first ten verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Or in some narrations, the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. And if you have to face, as we heard in the hadith, فَنَّعَنْهُ you run away, but if you have to face the Dajjal, you recite these verses, the Dajjal won't harm you by the will of Allah. And Surah Al-Kahf, and the ulama talked about the wisdom behind that, whether we know the wisdom or not, but this is sufficient for us. Surah Al-Kahf is about the fitan. It's about fitan. The major fitan in one's life, the fitna of the deen, when it comes to the story of the people of the cave themselves, they ran away from their people to protect their deen, the most valuable thing in their life. They, they don't play with their deen. The, the deen is not something to play with. As Sufyan al-Thawri also, Rahimahullah, said, if you had to, Muhammad also mentioned this, if you play with something, don't play with your deen. Your deen is not something to play with. You might lose it, you might have it, right? This is the first thing and the most important thing. So uh, they, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the surah with fitna, to, uh, fitna of the deen, the people of the cave, when they saved themselves to go to the cave, the fitna of ilm, the story of Musa alayhi salam and al-Khadr, ilm can be fitna for the person, whether to follow it or not, and the fitna of power, as the case of the Al-Qarnayn, uh, and the fitna of uh, wealth, like uh, the owner of, of the Jannatayn. So these are the fitan that we face that we need to have constant reminders of how to deal with these trials in our life. And if a person every time a fitna comes and he uh, fails in it, what, what to expect? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the hypocrites, they keep on being facing trials once or twice every year. So the fitan keeps on coming. And one of the signs of the hour that the fitan, when the fitan comes, the later fitna makes the person think of the previous one as was nothing. This was an easy one. But then it goes away and then comes the next one, a bigger one. And he would say, oh, the last one was much easier and so on. So to recite the verses, to memorize them. Uh, and the Prophet said, Man Whoever memorized the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, he will be protected from the Dajjal. And whoever had to face him, then let him then recite the beginning verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Uh, so this is again one of the ways to protect oneself. Uh, as we heard, and again I'm repeating it, one of the main uh, reason and way for a person to be protected from the fitna of the Dajjal and from all fitan is to listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. To follow the instructions as it is. Not according to my understanding and your understanding, but according to how the early generations of Islam understood it. So 
again I would mention the hadith man sami'a bid dajjal whoever heard about the dajjal falyan'a'anhu run away from him as far as you can fawallahi Prophet ﷺ said by Allah inna rajula layati the man would go to the dajjal wahuwa yahsibu annahu mu'min and the man thinks that he's a believer and he knows the dajjal fayatba'u and he would end up following him lima yaba'athu bihi min al-shubuhat because of how many shubuhat and doubts that he would send unto him the doubts that would make the iman removed from his heart and he would end up following the dajjal so it is not by what the prophet necessarily said about the characteristics of the dajjal and that's it you can know all, know all the characteristics of the dajjal but if a person does not follow the instructions and what the prophet said knowing that is not going to benefit the person so it's both warning from what the prophet as he said and uh, the second thing is to follow the way the prophet and do not a person should not expect that at the time of the fitna he would listen to the prophet hearts are by the full control of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so for someone to follow the way of the prophet this is a reward from allah and that's why a person should in the small things in matters of ease at times of ease a person should make sure that he does not put forward anything before the deen of allah and the way of the prophet uh, the, I'm not sure if, uh, if what's mentioned, if what happens before that with regards to the Mahdi and the send of the Mahdi and uh, the war between the Muslims and the Romans and the like of this has been mentioned or not but uh, this is also one of the signs of the hour and uh, there will be lots of uh, fitan and trials that people would face uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa since he's the final messenger to warn the people from anything and everything that they would need till the day of judgment for them to be protected so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from all fitan and from all trials and uh, if you have any questions please go ahead but we'll stop here and then the next subject is Isa alayhi salam and the nuzul of Isa alayhi salam Barakallahu feekum Alaykum No, what as is going to be mentioned inshallah ta'ala Isa alayhi salam when he comes down he's not coming down with a new tashri'a or so he is coming down to follow and that's why when he comes down in Salat al-Fajr he would uh, make al-Mahdi he's the one that leads but then uh, there's not mentioned about what is going to happen to the Mahdi but Isa alayhi salam of course he would lead the people so uh, this is what uh, it's not about two khalifas and things like this but there's no dalil about this but Isa alayhi salam will be the one the people he would lead the people and the people would listen to Isa alayhi salam but not to, as a new prophet he comes as a follower of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the Sharia of the Prophet وسلم, and he would make Hajj and Umrah and he would die and people would make Salah Salatul Janazah on him Anything else inshallah? Tund. No. If what? If I go, uh -huh. like in this situation, right. I close my eyes and I lower my head, then that, that, that say, hey, come. Hmm? No. I, I, I have conversation with him, then what will happen? When the Prophet ﷺ, he said that go to the one that is fire and close your eyes and talk to Ra'sahu, that means you lower your head and drink because it's cold water. Uh, the if questions, like what if the gel calls before I do this? What if the if questions, we don't need it because the Prophet ﷺ, if there was a, a benefit in knowing, he would have mentioned it. So that means there is no what ifs. So if we just follow that, that means a person will be guided to do exactly as mentioned if he had to face the jinn. 
there is no way that the Prophet ﷺ, he would not give what is very comprehensive uh, and he would give them less than what is needed. Like in situations again, what if that happened? There is no what ifs. It's not going to happen the way we might think things would happen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things. And that reminded me of uh, when Ibn Umar radiallahu uh, anhu, someone came to him and he was asking about a mas'ala in matters of hajj. And uh, he gave him the answer. So the man said, what if people push me this and that? So the man was from Yemen. So he said to him, اجعل ما دلو في اليمن Leave what ifs in Yemen. Right? Leave it there. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ said. So that would be sufficient inshallah. Tumbari. Tumbari. Oh, Jazakumullah Khair. Hold on, I will tell him. Any more questions? Tumbari. The question about the Dajjal will be on a donkey. Uh, how many years or how many years? It's a donkey with ears. With ears. Apart. apart uh, I've never heard something like this. When it, oh, well, that's, that's a different story. But uh, the, there's, and again, what, what, with, when it comes to the signs of the hour, there's so many fabricated stuff. And the reason for that, and the I mentioned, because we as human beings were fascinated with what's going to happen and uh, revelations and things like this. So that's why they make up stories and there are so many make up things that people would add which is not authentic whatsoever. One of the beautiful things also, but I, uh, you know, didn't want to, the time is, is constrained in this. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah, uh, he has a, he collected all of the different narrations which is authentic about the Dajjal and he put them together as one hadith as if you're reading one hadith and you put them like points and it was 49 points 49 things that it's all authentic about the Dajjal so this is a beautiful way to look into these evidences and he, it's even called uh, I believe Qissat Al-Masih Al-Dajjal the story of Al-Masih Al-Dajjal and it's published you can have it you can find it even uh, on the internet inshallah uh, I'm not sure if it's translated but uh, what is the meaning of Masih? Now, uh, the meaning, what is the meaning of Al-Masih? And actually, what is the meaning of Al-Masih al-Dajjal? Al-Masih has two meanings to it, or can have two meanings to it. One of which is uh, someone that is wiping. So whether it's his, his eyes is wiped. So for al-Dajjal, it's because he has one eye that is wiped. And for Masih Isa ibn Maryam, he's Masih because, which is the other meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped with him the kufr or disbelief. So al-Masih al-Dajjal, if it's word al-Masih is mentioned with regards to his eyes. Some people they say al-Masih, which is, but it's, al-Masih is fine, but he is a false one, but because of his eyes is wiped. Al-Dajjal is the liar, the one that is a, you know, a big liar. No. Now, one of the things that are mentioned in the, with regards to Al-Masih, the most people, as we said, the most people that would follow him are the Yahud, the Jews, and they will have their kingdom then. And this is the Masih that they're waiting for. This is what they're waiting for, and he would establish their kingdom then. And that's why it's one of the biggest fitna also. And he is the one that is calling himself as to be the Lord of the Alami. So, uh, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ said now. There's no specific, what, is, what about the Nasara? There's no specifics mentioned about what the Christians were there, of course, but the disbelievers, they, in general, they would follow the Masih al-Dajjal, and even from the Muslimin, they would follow the Masih al-Dajjal. They also have weak Iman and so on. Just the Nasara, they believe in... Right. And the, and the question is, the, the, the Christians and so on, they have this in their, in their books, and they know about the Dajjal, the Antichrist, and all of that. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مِنْ نَبَيِّنْ إِلَّا أَنْدَهُ قَوْمُ There is no Prophet unless he warned the people from the Dajjal. 
So all of the prophets, they warned again that the Dajjal, that's why everybody knows about him. But with the Prophet, والسلام, he gave us what no nations before gave us, was the information, specific information about the Dajjal. Now, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I heard something uh, about how there's going to be like, like many Dajjals or multiple Dajjals before mm -hmm. the Dajjal. No. Is that like a general term, of, like there's going to be many liars, or are they related to the Dajjal in one way or another? Right. Uh, there is, and that's also part of what uh, the question is, uh, there are going to be many Dajjalah, many Dajjals before the Dajjal. Uh, are they a part of the Dajjal, I guess, or are they meaning liars? Uh, this is one of the things that would happen before the Dajjal comes. And this is one of the signs that the Dajjal is coming. There will be many Dajjalah, that means many liars. But many liars would, with matters of people would follow them. And they would claim whether it's prophethood, they would claim that they are prophets. And the Dajjal in some of the narrations also that he would start by claiming that he's a prophet. And then he would change to claim that he is the Lord of the Alameen. So in, 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 in aspects of religion, so whether it's prophets, those who claim to be false prophets, or matters of religion that people would follow them in, 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 in when they're lying. So like somebody, say for example, like Fulham Ahmed, or like um, the other, uh, forgetting the name of them, like the leader of the uh, nation of Islam, like they could fall under the like, category of like... Now, the question is, mentioning the Qulaq Ulam Ahmed, the leader of the nation of Islam, things of that nature, uh, as far as the fiqh and the understanding of the signs of the hour, uh, we don't apply uh, these types of hadith on specific individuals, uh, but rather to leave it the way it is. Of course, they're liars. So are they are part of the Dajjala, that's what the hadith means. But in general, the, the meaning, the reason why I mention this is when, when some people, they start to explain certain signs of the hour, based on what we see nowadays. Like for example, if is, is what hap what's happening in Palestine today, this is part of the signs of the hour. We leave the subject of the signs of the hour aside because it's going to happen by the decree of Allah. No one would doubt this. And that's why it's not something for a person to, because the issue is the danger of the Mahdi, for example, when people followed someone. So, but Allah Alam, yes, there, there will be many Dajjal. And are we, are, are we close to the time of the Dajjal? Of course. No doubt about this. If, even if the Prophet at his time, he wasn't sure if the Dajjal uh, is going to come at his time. And he said, if he comes at, at your, at my time when he's alive, فَأَنَا حَجِيجُكُمْ I will protect you. I will be there. So I will suffice for you. And after me, فَكُلُّ مْرِئٍ حَجِيجُ نَفْسِهِ Every person, he is responsible for his own self. And the stories of Ibn Sayyid, this man at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, people were in doubt. Even the Prophet ﷺ himself, he was in doubt whether he is the Dajjal or not. And you go and ask him questions. And he said, إِخْسَأْ فَلَنْ تَعْدُوا قَدْرَكْ That he is not. So to that extent, even the Prophet ﷺ did not know when the Dajjal will come. Uh, uh, right. should, this question should be asked for the next one about Isa, but I've been waiting to ask it for like time now. Mm -hmm. But uh, the question was, um, there's a question that says, uh, speaking about Isa, says, yeah. No. So somebody said that um, if they're all going to believe in Isa, all Ahl Kitab, and if this is the verse means, um, then why would he be a Shaheed Alayhim? No. No. The ayah, وَإِن مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ نَبِيَ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا With regards to Isa alayhi salam when he comes down, meaning that when he comes down, people would have only two choices. Whether they believe in him or whoever they, whoever he sees from the people, from the disbelievers and those who disbelieve in him in the right way, they would die instantly. So the verse either refers, huh? people will die if whoever Isa السلام, comes down and look at someone his, as, as far as his eyes can reach, the, the disbelievers will die when he sees them because he won't take the jizya either al-Islam or they will die and uh, therefore the ayah as well they say in the tafsir of it the belief not necessarily the, the belief al-Iman al-Shara'i not necessarily the Iman the belief that they would get them uh, to be righteous it's the fact that the, it's the belief that it's too late like for example Amal Nabi when the, when the disbelievers would say uh, when the punishment comes, like Pharaoh, Amen to Billadi Unzi Aladi, 
آمنت بالذي آمرت به بنو إسرائيل. I believe in what the people of Bani Israel believed in. But this iman did not benefit him because it was after he saw the truth, meaning at the moment of death. So some said this is what it means, and the other meaning, which is also correct, those who would believe in him, and yes, they would, they were. Christians and when they see Isa alayhi salam they would believe in him in the right way that he's a messenger of Allah because when he comes down Yaksiru Sarib he would break the cross and kill the pig so uh, and they would believe in him in the right way and some would continue to be in their disbelief and this is when they'll die if, uh, as a result of that. There's a, a time frame where how long the Mahdi would lead the people before Isa alayhi salam comes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. As far as the authentic hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, there's no authenticity of exactly. Allah alam mentioned the number of, uh, of how long exactly. Yes, the hadith of Ibn Sayyid is authentic. That the, the, hadith, the question is about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he thought he was in doubt about this boy or Ibn Sayyid, that he was, whether he is the Mahdi or not. And this is authentic, yes. And, uh, and the, the Sahaba, even afterwards, they would, when they see him, they would fear. And one time they got him angry and he gets so big and they were worried about this. But, you know, this is, yes, this is true because it shows that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not even know when the Mahdi, when the, the Jad would come. No. Uh, when Isa alayhi salam, when he comes with the Christians, those who would believe in him, would they say the shahada or, uh, or so? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best the details. But yes, from the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam till the day of judgment, whoever becomes a believer, he has to say the shahada. So as we know that this is a must. So that's why the, the knowledge that is known by necessity, it doesn't have to be mentioned, but Either they will believe in him, meaning in the proper way that he's a prophet of Allah and so on, or only those who believe in him would live and the rest, they would die by just once he look at them. One last question, inshallah. No, actually, this is a good question. Is the Mahdi one of the major signs or the minor signs? Uh, assuming that also this was mentioned before, the Rama, when they talked about the major and the minor, this is a way to classify the signs, but it not necessarily was mentioned like this in these two categories when the Prophet ﷺ said of what's going to come ahead. But the ulama classified it in uh, certain ways, one of which is that the major signs refers to the things that's going to disrupt the norm of the life that we know today when it comes to the physical, physical means. The sun coming from the west, uh, Isa alayhi salam, these major signs that there's no more these normal means that people do things, the Dajjal for example, versus the, the spread of corruption and the spread of fitan and the Mahdi, some had mentioned it that it's, he's not from the major signs because there's nothing uh, extraordinary to the life of the people is going to happen. It's just normal activities of human beings so some classify them within the minor signs and some said that he is from the major signs because he's attached to the fact that Isa alayhi salam will come down and these major events will happen Allah well they told me we have uh, five four minutes I guess okay Go ahead. now the the the, the jail, would he come at the time of the Mahdi time or not when the Mahdi is there and a caller would call, as the Prophet ﷺ, he said, and he would say that in the Dajjal khalafakum fi dharikum, that means the Dajjal is, you know, he showed up in your families. This is when they're fighting with the Dajjal. So he would come when the Dajjal, or he, the Dajjal would come when Mahdi is present. So this is what the Prophet ﷺ said now. Um, it's just a question, I'm not sure if there are like specific answers or if there's uh, some type of information we have on it. Um, he said when he returns, like since he's a human being without perfect knowledge, and he's going to be a follower of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will we have to learn, say for example, like Arabic, and he will have to like learn the, the Quran, uh, as like all the other Sahaba did, 
Hmm. Or is that something that like Allah will give him like that will wisdom and knowledge and like uh, he'll be like happy as already when he comes and he'll have like no. uh, the enough knowledge of Islam no. already? The question is when Isa alayhi salam comes and he's a follower of the Prophet alayhi would he learn uh, the Arabic language for example and the deen of Islam and things like this or he will come being inspired to follow uh, there's no details of what's going to happen but the fact of the matter is that the Prophet ﷺ said when he comes down Isa alayhi salam he, and he would refuse to make the Imam of the Salah and he come as a follower of the Prophet ﷺ nobody would teach him the Salah of course he would come as Salatul Fajr he would free Salatul Fajr he would make Hajj and Umrah and he's going to be the one that leads the people like this so that means it's already as if yani it's known in an implicit way that he is not someone that other someone else will teach him. He comes as a follower of the Prophet ﷺ with all of what the Prophet ﷺ brought. And that brings something funny with the ta'asub and people when they're fighting with the madahib. Some said Isa ﷺ will be Hanafi when he comes down. Some said he's going to be Maliki. You know, <laughs> this is where is that knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, so all the issues within madhabs and things, all of that is going to get cleared when the issue of with the issues of the madahab will go away when Isa alayhi salam comes down and things like this. When it comes to the madahab al fiqhiyya actually there's no problems whatsoever and this, these types of differences were present at the time of the Prophet alayhi salatu meaning with the companions of Allah anhum in the matters of fiqh, in the matters of the furu'ah. The problem is the ta'asub, is the prejudice and fighting and, and being enmity with one another or the differences in matters of aqidah which is evil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and uh, there's always definitely when two opposite opinions, one is right and one is wrong, but what is wrong, it doesn't mean that the person is committing a sin. He gets a reward also as long as the concern is to follow the way the Prophet ﷺ. So Allah Allah, we'll stop here inshaAllah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh Muhammad wa sallam wa sallam. And after Salat al-Dhuhr inshaAllah we'll continue with the subject of Isa alayhi salam.
الله أكبر الله أكبر شد الله إلا الله شد محمد رسول الله أيا للصلاة أيا للهنا قد غابت الصلاة قد غابت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استووا تراسوا اعتذروا تسويت الصف من تمام الصلاة سدوا الخلل ميك ذا لاين ستريت استووا 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 
الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
الله اكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين بين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى we'll talk in this session about the second coming of Isa عليه السلام Jesus the son of Mary and the remaining of the major signs and the remaining of the major signs of the hour and as this is علم this is knowledge that we get to know from the Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that means we don't add anything to it and we, told, we don't take anything from it and we understand it the way they understood it and to leave the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his will he revealed to the Prophet ﷺ what is sufficient for us Prophet ﷺ he said مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ يُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى إِلَّا قَدْ أَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ There is nothing that would get you closer to Allah unless I commanded you to do it. مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ يُبْعِدُكُمْ عَنِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى إِلَّا قَدْ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ And there is nothing that would get you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless I forbade you from. So these types of events that is going to happen, there are actions applied to it, one of which is for us to believe in it. And that's part of the belief in the Day of Judgment. Al-Iman bil-Yawm al-Akhir, one of the pillars of Al-Iman, part of that is to believe about also the signs of the Day of Judgment as it's mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and to stay away from what people make up and fabricated things. And as Ibn Sarin rahimahullah said, in هذا العلم دين فانظروا عمن تأخذون دينكم This علم, this knowledge of this deen is deen itself. Seeking knowledge is deen, is religion. So look, see who you are taking the deen, your deen from. So not anybody that speaks about deen, we take our deen from. It has to be through this very clear lineage. The people of knowledge are the inheritors of the prophets. So the ulama, they don't invent things. They follow the way the Prophet والسلام, and they show what the Prophet والسلام, said and were upon. Isa السلام, as we know, one of Ulil Azm min al Rusul, one of the great messengers of Allah. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that his life or his birth is a miraculous one. And also that when he returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala previously, it was a miraculous thing. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascended Isa alayhi salam to him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated, as he said, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ They did not kill him, nor they crucified him. وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ He was made uh, him, his image similar to someone else. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهِ And those who differed among themselves with regards to the belief in Isa alayhi salam, they are in doubt. There is no authenticity whatsoever to what they are upon. ما لهم به من علم إلا اتباع الظن they only follow their whims and no علم no authenticity whatsoever وما قتلوه يقينا certainly with certainty they did not kill him بل رفعه الله إليه الله سبحانه وتعالى elevated him وكان الله عزيزا حكيما and Allah سبحانه وتعالى is the Almighty the most wise everything is by the will of Allah Allah سبحانه وتعالى is able to do all things but then also Allah سبحانه وتعالى said with regards to the day of judgment, he said that he is, meaning Isa alayhi salam, one of the signs of the hour. وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِلسَّاعَةِ فَلَا تَمْتَرُنَّ بِهَا He's one of the signs of the hour. And the ayah that we just talked about in the previous session, when someone asked about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Isa alayhi salam, وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا None of the people of the book, unless he will believe in him before he dies. And in the day of judgment, he will be a witness against them. And we mentioned one part of it is that when he, Isa alayhi salam, comes down, everybody will believe. And the disbelievers, they will die instantly when the eyes, when the sight of Isa alayhi salam would reach them. So there will be only Islam on the face of earth. So people will believe in him when he comes down. Uh, and also the meaning of which because the Ramah when they said وَإِن مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ Before his death. Before whose death? Some said the death of Isa which is he's not dead yet. He will die 
later when he comes down alayhi salam and then he will make hajj and umrah and so on and then he will die and people would pray salatul janaza on him as the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said so kullu nafsan dhaiqatul maut every soul shall taste death so some said this is refers to isa alayhi salam and some of the ulama they said which is a valid opinion it refers to the al-kitabi to the jew or the christian before he dies individually before they die they will see the reality of it that isa alayhi salam was nothing but a messenger of allah not divine not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the son of allah um, there are many hadith as with regards to the jail that are mentioned about isa alayhi salam but this is a matter of belief of course as we know and more details of this one of which the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam he even mentioned the place the specific place that he will come down uh, in alayhi salam in the minarat al-bayda sharqay damask damascus in a specific place and with the time when isa alayhi salam would come down is as it's mentioned in surah abi dawood and others that uh, he will come at the time when people are already lined up and these are the ones that are fighting with al-mahdi and they will be fighting also at the jail he would come down down at salatul fajr as the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said laysa bayni wa bayna isa nabi there is no prophet between me and isa alayhi salam wa innahu nazil and he is coming down fa idha ra'aytumuhu fa'rifu if you see him then acknowledge him رجل مربوع إلى الحمرة والبياض مربوع not too tall not too short between redness and white ينزل بين ممصرتين كأن رأسه يقطر he come down and as if his uh, with his head dripping uh, like pearls وإن لم يصبه بلل and there is no uh, wetness there's, he's not wet but this is how he looks and he would come down when uh, again people they were lined up for Salatul Fajr and uh, Imamuhum is Rajulun Salih which is Al-Mahdi فَبَيْنَمَا إِمَامُهُمْ قَدْ تَقَدَّمَا يُصَلِّ بِهِمُ الصُّبْحِ while the Imam he come forward to lead them in Salatul Subh which is Salatul Fajr إِذْ نَزَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ عِيْسَى ibn وَرْيَمْ Isa alayhi salam comes down at that moment they see him فَرَجَعَ ذَلِكَ الْإِمَامُ يَنْكُسْ this imam would walk with his back as always when the imam wants to go back for someone else to lead for Isa alayhi salam to come forward فَيَضَعُ عِيسَى يَدَهُ بَيْنَ كَتِفَيْهِ Isa alayhi salam would put his hand between the shoulders of the imam of the muslimin and he would say تَقَدَّمْ فَصَلِّ you go forward and you pray فَإِنَّهَا لَكَ أُقِيمَتْ the salah was made a comma for you he would lead them in the salah and in one of the narrations he said in ba'dakum ala ba'din umara you are umara you are leaders the plural of amir to one another takrimat allah li hadhihi al umma aw takramat allah hadhihi al umma allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor this umma by having you leaders to one another so the which states clearly that isa alayhi salam is not coming down as a prophet with revelation but rather to follow he's a prophet of allah of course but he's not coming with a new message he's coming to follow the Prophet ﷺ in every aspect of the deen. Of course, in matters of belief, Al-Anbiya Ikhwatul La'allat as the Prophet ﷺ, he said there are prophets, there are brothers, uh, not from the same father, and they came with the same message, but when it comes to the tashri'ah, halal and haram, and things like this, that can be different from one messenger to the other. So Isa ﷺ would not come down with what the rules and the sharia that was at his time but rather the way of the prophet والسلام, and this is all from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would follow that exactly as the way of the prophet والسلام. and the prophet والسلام, uh, he would say كيف أنتم إذا نزل فيكم ابن مريم فأمكم منكم how would you be when Isa the son of Mary comes down onto you and one of you would lead the salah and uh, one of the narrations أَمَّكُمْ not just leading you in the salah because one of the narrations or uh, the narrator of the hadith which is Al-Walid ibn Muslim he said uh, فَأَمَّكُمْ بِكِتَابِ رَبِّكُمْ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى وَسُنَّةِ نَبِيِّكُمْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. He would lead you by the book of your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Quran and by the sunnah of your Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم So uh, he comes down 
and the Mahdi is there with the people and they were uh, about to fight uh, at Dajjal and Isa السلام, would be the one to kill the Dajjal as the Prophet والسلام, said and again as always mentioned uh, really the hadith about the signs of the hour teaches us more than the events teaches us aqidah because this is part of the aqidah but also teaches us how to understand the aqidah the people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah are far away from any contradictions we're not talking about the individuals about the manhaj there's no faults in it and the first levels of corruption is contradictions right as Shaykh al-Islam Tamir rahimahullah he said no contradictions whatsoever so when you read these ahadith you don't have to twist meanings so that you would it would fall into your matters of belief no this is how they believe in the names and attributes of Allah the matters of unseen the principle here is that we leave the amirruha kama jaat leave it the way it is don't distort the meanings of it don't try to explain it in the light of what you see with your own eyes in whatever century that you're living in don't call the Dajjal as the television for example some you know people deviants they said this because they don't want to believe in something to be supernatural so they say it's the television uh, is this and that no is as the Prophet ﷺ said and the like of these people they are more likely to follow the Dajjal then because they would not ever imagine that someone would come with these fitan and as we heard in the hadith people would go thinking that they are believers and they would end up following him because of the so many shubuhat and doubts that he would install in them but those who are immune by the wahi of revelation from Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things and we are, we are being informed we have been now educated of what things is going to be so leave it the way it is don't try to distort the meaning of it so here the hadith the reason I said this in this hadith and the previous hadith is because of the subject then uh, part of the hadith where the Prophet والسلام, he said when they uh, go and they would uh, open the gate Bablud is a specific gate which is known to the people of today where Isa السلام, will kill a Dajjal he said فَإِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهِ الدَّجَّالِ it's a long hadith but in it فَإِذَا نَظَرَ إِلَيْهِ الدَّجَّالِ once the Dajjal sees and look at al Masih al-Dajjal the one that is كَانَ يَعِيثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا claiming to be the Lord and going east and west and doing whatever all these uh, things that people would believe in him that he is the Lord of the Alameen the skies to rain and the earth to bring its treasures and all of this once Isa alayhi salam he look at him ذَابَ كَمَا يَذُوبُ الْمِلْحُ فِي الْمَاءِ he would melt the same way the salt melt in water some of these mutafadlikeen, those who think that they are smart enough, when they're not smart, they would say, oh, it means it's a metaphoric thing. Means that he would, you know, you can use the same statement when you say someone was so shy as if he just melted. My heart melted when I saw it, like this. No, this is a matter of ghaib, unseen. And we saw in the hadith how the, the Prophet was very really specific and how they would ask specific questions. So here, he would melt like the salt would melt in water and he would uh, run and flee فَيُدْرِكَهُ عِنْدَ بَابِ رُدْ الشَّرْقِي Isa alayhi salam would uh, reach him get him by the gate of Lud the eastern one and he would kill him so he says فَيَهْزِمُ اللَّهُ الْيَهُودَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defeat the Yahud then so uh, and this is again uh, to make the matter very clear in Sahih Muslim فَإِذَا رَآهُ عدو الله if the enemy of Allah at the jail saw Isa alayhi salam ذاب كما يدو الملح في الماء he would melt like the salt would melt in the water فلو تركه لن ذاب حتى يهلك if he would leave him he will melt till he dies so he start melting he will melt till he dies ولكن يقتله الله بيده فيريهم دمه حربته that means but he would kill him so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would kill him with his own hand. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will kill a Dajjal by the hand of Isa alayhi salam and he would show them the blood in his spear so that they see that he is nothing but a creation of Allah. He's not what as he stated to be. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed the matter. After the Dajjal is killed, then it's another fitna. The fitna is not over yet, which is another major sign, which is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The fitna of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, 
which is mentioned in the Quran and mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, and it's mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf also the Surah that mentions all the types of fitan and over and over again this is another fitna that nowadays sometimes some people also they might deny as the ancestors of deviants they denied these types of signs of the hour because they presented these signs to their limited deficient way of thinking and reasoning that is limited as limited to the wall of them you cannot go beyond this we are we are very trapped in our own limited life and uh, undermining the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, yeah, Jujar, Jujar are a huge nation and uh, to know the, the, the magnitude of them and this is again uh, quite some details but before we get there is when it comes to Isa alayhi salam the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam also said وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي by the one that my soul is in his hands swearing by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَيُوشِكَنَّ أَنْ يَنْزِلَ فِيكُمْ مِنُ مَرْيَمْ very close Ibn Maryam the son of Mary will come down unto you hakaman adlan to rule and he's adl he's just fayaksiru salib he will break the cross wayaqtiru khinzir and he would kill the pig wayadaul harb no harb no more war and in other narrations al jizya also there's no jizya there's no uh, the taxation uh, for the disbelievers because no one of those who disbelieve in Allah will still exist and the wealth will be in abundance to the extent of which nobody would accept and nobody wants it because there's so much of it to the extent of which one sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than this whole world and whatever it contains the good deeds because the people are believers and they see the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if they see and in some of the narrations they would see their ranks in, in Jannah so there's nothing more beloved to them than the good deeds and by the way you can live this life now because everything is been is happening whatever a person do a good deed what's happening now is that the deeds are recorded uh, the, the the rewards are being prepared for them in Jannah so with the yaqeen with the certainty in the hearts of the believers nothing is more joyful to them than their obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they don't need for a messenger of Allah to come and to tell them specifically that this is the reward that you get. Of course, there is al khabar al mu'ayana. When you hear about something, is different than what you see it. But it's still with the certainty in the hearts of the believers, the end result is the same. So a call for each and every one of us to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to waste one's life. So, and the Prophet والسلام, mentioned yeah, Juj and Majuj at the time of Isa السلام, when he would come down. Uh, after he comes down, then they will be told that yeah, Juj and Majuj came out. In the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that Ba'ath Ahl in the day of Al Qiyamah, when Adam والسلام, will be commanded to take the people to the hellfire, and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Who are them? He said, From in Kulli Alf, to Su'ma'a, wa Tis'a, wa Tis'a'un, fin Nar, wa Wahid fil Jannah. 999 in the hellfire and one in Jannah. So when this was made difficult to the companions of Allah anhum, in one of the narrations, the Prophet والسلام, he said, from the people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, 999 and one uh, from uh, Jannah. And of course, that means there are, there are lots of them. There are nation that are so many in number. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described them clearly. From every uh, hill they're coming down. It's like they cover the earth of how many numbers there are. And they would pass by the, the lake of Tawai, they would drink it all. Imagine a nation that would drink the entire lake. Right, so uh, this is how much they are in number. But the thing that would make people, those who they put their own reason before the wahyu from Allah, they said, how can they be hidden? Nowadays when we have all of these satellites and all of the sophistication, and they're not able to see where they are on the face of earth, because they're present on the face of earth. And in Surah Al-Kahf and al qarnayn and what, he's, what he did where he built the dam. And they're hidden in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, Woe to the Arab from Sharr, evil that is coming closer. And the Prophet ﷺ said that uh, opened from the, from the wall that is built to prevent Ya'juj and Ma'juj from coming is like this. And the Prophet ﷺ made a circle with the forefinger and the index finger. That means the matter is getting closer and every time they go dig and dig and then 
at the end of the day a small portion opens and then they would say we'll come back tomorrow to finish but they don't say inshallah they come back the next day and it's the same thing who goes back to the original form and they keep on digging every day till a day would come and they would uh, it would they would come back and they find it the same and then they will uh, get out of where they are and the fitna will start so this is a test also for the believers right it is not according to what we see with our own eyes it's as simple as the fact is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to make them hidden from the eyes of the people you know what's wrong with that there's nothing difficult with this whatsoever if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will for people not to see them they won't see them so when the time they come out then the people would witness this fitna because again we have wahi from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so uh, Isa alayhi salam and the believers with him uh, they will be trapped in uh, the mountain of or the mount of Tur because of the, this great fitna of Ya'juj and Ma'juj and, and uh, you know the, all kinds of details of because of the time and then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send onto the people of Ya'juj and Ma'juj uh, as Prophet said فَيُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا كَأَنَاقِ الْبُخْتِ birds like the, uh, the their heads is like the heads and the necks of the camels and uh, this is to take them to to remove them from the earth after they die from a naf which is a, a a worm that is known to the arabs that it comes into the nose of the animals and it uh, causes them to die something that is not even seen so this is how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will kill them and there are details in the hadith where they reach a state when they finish all of the people on the face of earth to as far as they know and they would even shoot their arrows to the skies and they say now we finished with the people on the earth let's finish with the ones those who are in the skies and they would shoot their arrows to the skies and it comes back as a fitna for them with blood in it so they say now we killed the people on the face of earth and now we killed those who are in the heavens and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send will send this uh, naf and it will kill them all instantly and the earth will be full of this rotten smell from their corpses and their uh, in a way that people will not be able to live and that's when isa and his people they come down and they realize he sent someone to check <coughs> on yajuj and majuj and he goes down and he realizes that the earth is covered with their bodies and the smell becomes in such a, a way that life becomes impossible and they would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Isa alayhi salam and the believers that uh, this is made easy for them so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send these huge birds and this is as, as mentioned the authentic hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam would take their bodies in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and then he would send rain for 40 days to clean the earth and it becomes like a, a very soft uh, place as the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said because of how it's as the Prophet said and then the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire the earth to to plant and it will become so much barakah and blessings that a group of people would eat from one pomegranate and uh, the barakah will be so much uh, and the one um, um, as they say laha from al ibil when you when you milk the camel one time it would be sufficient for a group of people and things of that nature and there be you know peace and no war and no killing and nothing whatsoever even the snakes the children will play with it the beasts they won't harm anyone so this is after the killing of Ya'juj and Ma'juj uh, and then Isa alayhi salam as it's mentioned in Sunan Abi Dawood and others that he would stay on the face of earth for 40 years and then he will die and the Muslimin will make Salatul Janazah on him. And as the Prophet Ali Yusuf Sami said, Well, Ladi Nafsi Biyadi, the Hilan Abn Maryam, Bifadja Rauha, the Maryam will make Ihlal with the Umrah and Hajj. He will put the Haram on and he would say, Labbaik Allahumma Umrah, Labbaik Allahumma Hajj, Hajj and Mu'tamira. Make Hajj and he would make Umrah. And the Prophet Ali Yusuf Sami also praised those who will be with Isa Ali Salam from the believers. They are followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this is in Musnad Imam and others which is a sound hadith where the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam he said أصابتان من أمتي أحرزهم الله من النار Two group of my ummah Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala shielded them, protected them from the fire عصابة تغزو الهند 
the group, those who would invade India and liberated it, and this happened. وَعِصَابَةٌ تَكُونُ مَا عِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمْ And the group, those who will be with Isa uh, ibn Maryam, the son of me. So uh, this is again by the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, the hadith, again, we limit ourselves and we should be limited to what is authentic in the books of the hadith and not to go beyond these many endless uh, claims and lies that the people would bring. Uh, and then afterwards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send uh, a wind and as far, you know, people would live Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how long and by the way when someone asked about how long the Mahdi would live and we said, and he said I do not know there is a narration in the what is mentioned about Isa alayhi salam that Al-Mahdi his mulk will be for seven years his mulk will be for seven years and that's why the, the ulama they say then afterwards Isa alayhi salam will be in charge and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best but uh, when it comes to uh, right or after Isa alayhi salam he would live for 40 years as we heard uh, and then he will die and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how long the people would live the believers there's no disbelievers only believers but then it, from the hadith or from what the ulama they said things will start to change again as the way on earth generations to come shaitan things of that nature and then a wind will be sent uh, to take all the souls of the believers in a light way and they would feel of it as a pinch under their arm and this pleasant wind will take them even it would enter even the caves and everything to take only the lives of the believers and only the disbelievers and the worst people will be present on the face of earth and upon them the day of judgment will occur so uh, this is with regards to that. There are many also other hadith that talks about uh, certain things would happen in which people go back again to worshipping idols. Uh, and uh, this has to be understood in the light of what is being mentioned. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ said that the hour is not going to be established until the people of the khulasa would worship uh, the idols that the women of those will uh, will walk around the, the the idol of the khalasa so that means they go back to worshipping idols as the way they are in jahiliya and things like this Prophet sends Sahih Muslim that uh, the hour is not going to be established till the people they would worship again Allah wal Uzza the idols that were worshipped at the time of Jahiliya. So the Prophet, uh, so Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, O Prophet of Allah, I thought that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed down who will the Arsal Rasulah will Huda within the Haqq, you will hear about the Dini Kuli, you will carry on Mushrikun. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make his religion apparent and superior over all of the religions, even the Mushrikun, if they hate that. So he said, alayhi salatu wa sallam, this is how it's going to be. And this is going to be as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a pleasant wind to take the soul of anyone that has in his heart the weight of a mustard seed of an iman So the only ones that will be left on the face of earth are those who have no goodness in them They will go back to the religion of their forefathers So this is after Isa alayhi salam and the Dajjal and Ya'juj and Ma'juj not before that, as some people might think it is. It's after all of these major signs of the hour. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned even evil actions that these people would do to the extent of which people would have relations between men and women. Like the donkeys and the animals they do in the, in the roads and things like this. And the best of them is the one that would say if you would find a place to hide. <coughs> this is the best among them. So, which is, of course, it shows how evil they are. And uh, also the hadith that talks about that uh, those suwaiqatayn uh, and the suwaiqatayn from the shin, referring to the legs. And he's from Abyssinia and he's someone that he has, uh, his legs are bent. Uh, he looks in such a way that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that he will be the one that 
would extract the treasures of the Kaaba. So they will destroy the Kaaba. This is again at the very end of things, right? And he would extract from the Kaaba underneath it is a treasure that he would extract it. And people, no one is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone is upon disbelief and upon these people the hour will be established. Upon these people the hour will be established because already the lives or the souls of the believers will be taken away. Um, and that's why the, the basically these are the the different signs that uh, is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, but also uh, the hashr that is mentioned in uh, or, or the fire that would uh, gather the people tahshur uh, nas and they will be and I will read the hadith for you is where the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih al-Bukhari yuhshur nas ala thalathi taraq the people will be gathered. There's hashr. The word hashr when we hear it, it refers to the hereafter. But when it comes to the signs of the hour, there's a physical hashr in this life. And the meaning people will be gathered. Not necessarily as this is the day of judgment, but it's an arm or a fire that would come from Adan, from Al Yemen, Tahshur al Nas. Would keep on push, pushing the people towards the place of Al Mahshar, which is Al Sham. And, uh, uh, and this is refers to a hashr or a gathering that is in this life before the hashr which is in the day of judgment and this is also one of the signs of the hour as the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned uh, the, the signs of the hour as we know the major ones that's, which is mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, then the, the sun rises from the, from the west uh, and this is one of the, of course the major signs but this is the sign when there is no repentance will be accepted by the people uh, once the sun rises from the west and a dab which is the beast that uh, will come out to the people as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it in the Quran tasimun nas and it will brand the people on their uh, foreheads the disbelievers with kafir kafara or kafir that he's a disbeliever and this is the dab and uh, it was said that this will happen on the day that the sun rises from the west because there's no more repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, afterwards uh, uh, and this is basically you know, the major signs that would occur uh, as, as a matter of belief as we heard and a way for us to be upon and لا تقوم الساعة حتى لا يقال في الأرض Allah, Allah as the Prophet والسلام, he said the hour is not going to be established when anyone till, till everyone no one would ever say Allah, Allah the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be uh, mentioned whatsoever. That means people would be among disbelief and there won't be um, believers whatsoever. Uh, so uh, basically these signs of the hour or the major signs of the hour it's by the decree of Allah and as we heard the understanding of it is that we believe in it the way it is and we leave the matter to uh, how things will be. There's no actions for us to, uh, to do as a result of this. Some of the Muslims even, they say we're doing this, preparing for the Mahdi, preparing. You don't do anything to prepare for anyone. There's no uh, uh, commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for people to do anything about it. Or say, or even some of the Christians, they say they're doing this for the return of Isa alayhi salam and things of that nature. This is not the belief that the believers they have. And they believe in the return of Isa alayhi salam by itself is as we show uh, and as we heard the Prophet والسلام, the final messenger of Allah and, and stating the matter and Isa is someone that people have different beliefs in him and he would come back and the people would follow him the believers would follow him and those who disbelieve they would die when they uh, see him uh, and that by itself is one of the miraculous things or one of the proofs of the truth of the Prophet والسلام, in his statement as well they say he did not say that to him about himself but rather for Isa السلام, and he's a follower and as a matter of belief of course that the best man ever walked on the face of earth is the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, without undermining any level of the Prophets of Allah uh, and no one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perfected his speech and actions like he did to the Prophet والسلام, and that's why we are commanded to follow him in every speech and actions that he was upon uh, the hadith of Tamim al-Dari which is uh, just going to refer to it last time. Uh, I would like to mention something from it because it's something that also it shows the, to leave the matter to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This hadith in Sahih Muslim 
when uh, Fatima bint Qais radiallahu anha she heard the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam someone is calling the one that the Prophet alayhi salam appoint, appoint to call and he said the salatu jami'ah it's time for the salah for them to make salah so she prayed with the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam behind of course the men and the lines of the women and then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam sat on the member and he was smiling and he said, let everyone stay in this place where, he, where you prayed. And he said, do you know why I gathered you? Why did I bring you together? They said, Allah wa Rasulu A'lam. He said, uh, by Allah, I did not gather you for something that I'm needing for you or from any fear for you to fear. But I gathered you because Tamim ad dari he was a Christian man. And he came and he became a Muslim. And he mentioned to me something that coincide with what I've told you about Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. And then he mentioned that he was in a, uh, a ship uh, with 30 men uh, from specific places and they were, the, the waves of the sea took them far away for a month till they went to a jazeera or, a, or a, an island and towards the west, he said. And they entered this island and they saw this huge beast or animal that is full of hair they don't know the front from the back from that thing and they said why like who are you it says anal jassasa they said what is the jassasa uh, and then uh, she uh, or that that thing someone said it's shaitana it's it's a devil so we ran away till we entered that building like a deer or monastery or whatever there is and we saw in it the 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 most humongous human being that we ever saw and he was chained with heavy chains and his hands are chained to his necks to his neck and his, there's chains from his knees to his heels so we said to him why like a man woe to you who are you he said now you you get to see me or uh, so he said to them you inform me who are you they said, نحن أناس من العرب We are people from the Arab We uh, were sailing in a, in a ship And uh, the, the wind or the, 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 the waves took us all kinds of places And then they told them what happened basically So uh, he asked them certain questions And he said to, him, to them فأخبروني عن نخل بيسان Ask me, uh, tell me, inform me Of the palm trees of Bisan, which is one of the cities in Palestine. And they said to him, What exactly you're asking about the palms of Bisan? He said, I ask you about its palms, palm trees. Is it giving fruits? <clears throat> and then he asked them about the lake of Tabariya, which is also uh, well known in Palestine. So they said, what do you ask about the, the, the lake? He said, Hal fiha ma? is there any water in it? So they said, Hiya kathiratul ma, has lots of water. So he said, Ama inna ma'aha yushiku an yadhab. Very soon, the water of the lake is almost going to be gone. Then he asked them uh, about Ain uh, Zahar, which is uh, a town in, uh, in Sham, known. Uh, he asked them about it. And they said, for what, what exactly you're asking for? He said, Hal fil ma? Is there spring water in this uh, spring place or this well? And do people cultivate with using this water? They said, yes, it's, it's abundance. So then he asked them about Nabi al Ummiyin. He said, I'm asking you about the Prophet of the illiterate ones. So what happened to him? They said, Qad kharaja in Mecca. He came out in Mecca. So, uh, so he said that uh, how's the prophet of the illiterate ones? They said, "Qad kharaja in Mecca." He came out from Mecca, and he is in Yathrib in Medina now. So he said, "Aqatalahu al-Arab." Did the Arab fight against him? They said, "Yes." So he said, "How did he do with them?" He said, "Qad zahra ala man yalihi min al-Arab." He becomes superior now, and they are obedient to him. So he said, "Qad kana dalik." This has actually happened. They said, "Yes." He says, أَمَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ لَهُمْ أَنْ يُطِيعُوا He said, it is better for them that they obey him وَإِنِّي مُخْبِرُكُمْ عَنِّي And I would inform you about myself. أَنَا الْمَسِيحِ I am the Masih which is the Dajjal. 
وإني أوصيك أن يؤذن لي في الخروج. and very soon it will be made أو أو will be given the permission to come out. فأخرج فأسير في الأرض. I will come out and I will walk in the land. فلا أدع قرية إلا هبطها. I would never, I would not miss miss a town unless I will enter it in forty nights. Except مكة أم طيبة. Mecca and and Medina, they are forbidden for me, both of them. Every time I want to enter one of them, an angel would say, would face me with a sword that is out, preventing me from entering it. And on every place outside, there are angels that are supporting and protecting it. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard this, and he did this with his stick on the member he said هذه طيبة هذه طيبة this is طيبة this is طيبة which is al Medina. and he said to the people didn't I inform you of this they said yes so he said I like that what he mentioned was exactly as I told you and uh, the Prophet والسلام, did not deny of what Tamim al-Dari uh, عنه said so uh, whether this was the Dajjal himself as the ulama of sunnah they say or whether he is someone that knows about the Dajjal meaning being a shaitan but those who said that he's the Dajjal himself that means he's alive but he's chained uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best so uh, this is uh, a way to show, to show again that the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us steadfast upon the deen of Islam to make us follow the way of the Prophet والسلام, and again sincere advice to myself and everyone uh, don't listen to these matters from the perspective of just a, a story or something like this but rather for us to build action as a result of that to be obedient to Allah and to save ourselves from the fitan you can continue until 255 okay So, uh, if you have any questions uh, with what has been mentioned, uh, go ahead, inshallah ta'ala. And of course, not every single details of the, of the signs of the hour has been mentioned. And whoever wants to refer back to uh, the, the books of hadith and the books that are compiled through this, inshallah. And the book, of course, that you guys are studying from. When the question is when the sun rises from the west and uh, the wind that would take the lives of the believers and only the disbelievers will be present and who would be asking for forgiveness before that? First of all, as far as the orders exactly of the major signs of the hour, we don't have a specific way of knowing what exactly comes before what. Uh, but this is more of a shtihad from the ulama when they put things together according to what the Prophet ﷺ said. But the fact that the people had a choice versus there is no more choice. So people, they have choice to believe and to repent, but they don't repent and, 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 and return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala versus the matter is over. Once the sign rises from the west, no one uh, is going to be, even if they repent to Allah, it's not accepted because now something major is happening. The unseen becomes seen as the wisdom behind it. And uh, also, the, these are the two things that you know, the time when it comes, there's no repentance. When the sun comes from the west, as the Prophet ﷺ said, and also when the soul of a person reaches al hulqum reaches one's throat. Means the moment of the soul coming out of the body where the person is now moving from this life of this world to the unseen becomes seen, which is then it's too late. He already believed. As we said, belief, that means you believe in something that is al-ghaib or unseen. If you see it with your own eyes, you say, I, you don't say, I believe. I don't say, I believe that uh, there's a bar of water in front of me. You say, there's a bar of water in front of me. The word, I believe, that means it's unseen, and you believe in what uh, is the unseen. Tom. 
Naam, Ahsan, is there will be three major earthquakes that would come as part of the signs of the hour. Yes, and this is usually categorized with the, with the minor signs of the hour. Uh, and it's not necessarily three earthquakes. The Zalazal Takthur is one of the signs of the hour that there will be lots of earthquakes, frequent earthquakes. But the three major things like that is khasf. Three major uh, khasf and khasf is the sinkhole. One in the east, one in the west, one in the Arab Peninsula. This is a sinkhole which is not necessarily an earthquake. No. And uh, other things, the Udu, Jizil, Arab, Mujan, and Haran, the Arab Peninsula will uh, Arab Peninsula will return back to be rivers and, and green and things like this. And other things will come to the minor one. Okay. How to stay steadfast at the times of fitan? We are living the fitan. And we are living the fitan of Akhir al-Zaman too. Once the Prophet ﷺ was sent, this is the end of times. It's not just now these uh, days that we live in. It's once the Prophet ﷺ was sent, because he's the final messenger of Allah, he was the first sign of the hour. What's the first sign of the hour? Ba'athatul Nabi. The Prophet ﷺ being sent. Bu'ithtu ana wa sa'a kahatayn. As he said, I was sent myself and the hour like these two fingers, and he pointed with his four fingers and four forefinger and the middle finger. That means as close as one to the other. So uh, then the fitan, of course, the jualat afiyah to hadi ummah fi awaliha, as the Prophet said, the strength for this ummah has been given to the beginning part of the ummah, and it will be fitan at the end of the ummah. So one word, otherwise this is a lecture, but one word, if you want to take this one word. As the Prophet ﷺ said, to protect yourself from the fitan, when they asked the Prophet ﷺ about the fitan, he said, Alaykum uh, bi'amrikum al-awwal. Be upon the first matters of yours. Meaning, the way that it was at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how to protect ourselves from the fitan, to go back, and to be upon what the Prophet ﷺ was upon and the companions of Allah and not to rush into things but rather in fitan be the last meaning don't do anything you won't be asked when it comes to the fitan in the day of judgment you won't be asked about something you didn't do why you didn't do it but rather you would be asked about something you did why did you do so we don't say anything we don't take a step unless we have certainty that this is something that is pleasing to Allah and the only way for us to know that it's pleasing to Allah is through the revelation from Allah analyzing things and interpreting things good intentions by itself is not sufficient and learning matters of belief even if it's against our own desire sometimes something inside of you you you, you think but how can that be but it's the way uh, as Rafi ibn Khadiji said, the Prophet ﷺ forbade us of something that was benefiting for us. But the obedience of Allah and His Messenger ﷺ is more benefiting to us. Go like this, go ahead. At the lake you mentioned, now dry up, where is that located today? Who? At the lake you mentioned? No, Tabariya. Where is it located today? It's, it's well known, uh, it's in Palestine. No, oh no, that's a different one. No. It's well known if you make search of uh, the Buhayr al Tabari. They, they claim that it's the water is less and things like this, but uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. No. Now, the, the question is, just the last part of the question is that when Isa a.s. dies and there will be only believers on the face of earth and then things will change because afterwards the wind will come take the lives of the believers and only the disbelievers will be present on the face of earth. So that's why things will change because this is how the nature of the human beings. Adam a.s. was upon pure iman. And then what happens? Shaitan doesn't leave people alone. alone. And that's why generation after generation things can change and then people fall into disbelief again and things of that nature. Go and then come back. Yeah, so two things. So one being that is it like mentioned that Allah can choose from the Jewish 
third and second being like how long uh, after the child comes will they arrive? Uh, how long Yajuj and Majuj will stay on the face of earth? I don't recall also numbers. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I'm, I'm, I don't know the, the answer to this one. I'm not sure if there is. Uh, and how long they will be till? Like, how long will it for them to arrive after the job? Or that's like killed by Allah knows best. How long they would come after the Dajjal? Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But it seems from the hadith that as soon as the Dajjal was killed, then. The you know the other fitna comes up, which is the yajuj and majuj. No, I think so. Right. The question is, uh, which which it seems to be from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ during the end of times, that people would uh, humanity would regress, and you hear about swords and horses. And Mahdi will send ten taliyah, ten horses, and things like this. Does that mean things will change and humanity go back again to the to the old ways of fighting? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. Some of the Arabs they said that, and they went even far to say, which is again, it's not for for us to say. We can we, we can't dis, dis, explain things in the light of what we see nowadays. So some said everything will be destroyed, and then uh, people will start over again. Allah knows best, maybe. And it does not, no contradiction. Some people, they still use horses. You know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. No. Uh, during the minor signs or the major signs of the hour, with the ibadat, will, the reward of it is more. The more the uh, good deeds are done at times of fitan, the more rewards it is for sure. And the Prophet والسلام, said, Ibadatun fil harj ka hijratin ilay. Making ibadah in times of harj, and harj is al qatl, too much killing and so on, is like making hijrah to the Prophet. And he said that Ya'ti ala ummati zaman al qabidu fi ala dini kal qabidu ala jamratin min nar. A time would come, the one from my ummah that holding fast to the religion is like holding fast to a hot coal. Ajrul wahid minun ka khamsina minkum. The reward of one of them is like the reward of 50. Of you, and he said, "Alayhi salatu wasalam." In the narration, "Inna kum tajidun al khairi awaman." You find people to help you to do good, but they don't. So that means the reward are, are more. The reward is more. When then you know, go back to them. Kasir, yes, yes. Mashallah, pay attention. Mashallah. The, the, the hadith of Tamim al-Dari that they saw a man uh, I've never seen a man bigger as he is and in the hadith of Dajjal that he's qasir ad'aj that he's short so whether he's short and big or uh, Allahu A'lam so Allah knows best yes but again the, the statement of Tamim al-Dari is not hadith we have to be careful this is he, he's narrating what he saw so we cannot take it as a hadith. Versus the hadith, of course, it's a hadith, it's a statement of the Prophet that means it's wahi from Allah. Is there any hadith about the, the beast having the stick of Musa or the ring of Sulaiman uh, Not that I know of. And there's no mention of this in the books of hadith when it comes to that. Uh, even the, the verses, subhanAllah, uh, the stories of Suleiman and things like this it mentions in the Quran that there is some things that leaves it uh, with details uh, of what happened and that's why you find in the Israeliyat so many different fairy tale situations with the ring of uh, Suleiman and when he took it out he lost his kingdom and then he re which is a fact that it's stated in the Quran that he lost his kingdom and then the kingdom returned back to him again but the details of that is left in the Quran for a reason, because there's no benefit in knowing. But then you would read, it's really like fairy tales of, of how things are. Well, Allah knows best. No. No, out when Juj and Majuj will come, the question would they kill out of 1,999? No, what the, this 1,999 is in the Day of Judgment. One will enter Jannah and 999 from Ya'juj and Ma'juj entered the Hafir. We choose how many there are numbers, there are greater numbers. No. 
Naam ahsant. One of the major signs of the hour is a dukhan which is the smoke. And this is in the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ counted the ten major signs of the hour. A dukhan is the smoke which is mentioned in Surah al-Dukhan. And Ibn Mas'ud and others عنهم, used to consider that that already happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ when they saw smoke and the time of the people of Quraysh. And the majority they say that they didn't happen yet. So whether this is from the major signs because the Prophet ﷺ included it or mentioned it with the sun and the dabba and the three khusuf uh, and the like of this which is mentioned the major signs now. Anything else? Yeah, I'll verify this, but uh, I was listening to this band said that after Isa A.S. passes away, he'll be buried beside the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Is this true or? Uh, the fact that Isa A.S. is he is he going to be buried next to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, as far as the authenticity of this, Allah knows best. It's mentioned, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best uh, when uh, or where he is going to be buried. And Allah alam, I don't recall. So I can check that out, inshallah. No. Uh, like, uh, they have the cover uh, beside Muhammad uh, grave, right? Hmm. That this one that's empty, David, if I'm not mistaken, right? Was that, uh, is there or is there? Is there? Uh, I'm sorry? No, there's no such a thing as they have an empty grave for Isa السلام, next to the Prophet There's no mention of that uh, among even the early generations of Islam and so on. No, no. no the Nagaf. It's the Nagaf is a small worm. That they, they know that come, uh, it affects the goats and the sheep and the camels. Uh, it affects their nose and cause them to die. So that's what the like of that is gonna, going to kill Yajuj and Majuj. But the birds, the humongous birds with the necks like camels, will come and clear the earth from the bodies of Yajuj and Majuj, take them in a place that Allah knows best where. I'm sorry? Is the jail human? Yes. The jail is a human being. And he that's why the those who said about the hadith of Tamim al Dari, they said no, this is probably shaitan because the the jail will be you know born from a mother and a father in a normal way. So but even if it's the hadith of Tamim al Dari what what they saw, is the Dajjal he's still a human being and he will die at the end now. No, I'm told. Exactly. No. Right, this is at the end, at the very end, which is also I did mention after the destroy when the, the Kaaba will be destroyed and Al Quran will be lifted. The Prophet mentioned Quran Sayurfa Al Quran will be lifted. Uh, because no no believers anymore. So the Quran will be lifted and no one on the face of earth will say Allah Allah. No. One and one, and that's it because of the time. Tfadda. Uh, you're able to verify this, but I was listening to Bayan by Asafadi, and he was saying that the Sula was like someone who was sitting, and he just performed the Salah, and after he was done to Riyadh Islam, came to him and towards his right was uh, Isa Alayhi Salam, where his left was a, like, Masih at the Jal. He was giving his description kind of over there. Hmm. As far as the hadith where the Prophet Alayhi Salam was given, he looked at Isa to the to his right and and the Messiah, uh, Messiah the Jal on his left, and he gave this description of them. As far as that specific narration, I don't remember any like that. You had something. I just want to clarify the timeline so that uh, first it would be uh, Imam Mahdi, hmm. and then uh, Isa al Islam, and then Yajuj and Majuj. You said Mahdi, and then Dajjal, and then Isa, then Isa al Islam, and then Yajuj and Majuj. Not, not one of the major signs, but the first sign. The first sign. Mm -hmm. uh, 
the question is about the Mahdi. Is he one of the major or the minor signs? We uh, someone asked this question before Salat al Dhuhr. Uh, it depends on how you, how people look at the major and the minor. Some said that he is one of the last minor signs, the last minor sign, because there's no uh, change to the universe in a way that it's uh, just normal life fighting and things like this. It's a major one from the sense that he's the Mahdi and so on. And uh, that's why the beginning of the major signs is Isa alayhi salam because this is the diff di different than the way the, the normal life of the people and the Dajjal of course. The Dajjal before that is the first major of the signs now. Allah Allah. طيب. Should we have one question? Tabr. The, the major thing that the ulama group, the major and the minor signs based on uh, the universal means once it starts to change uh, then this is the major signs like the Dajjal he does things that is not according to the laws of, of how we know the universe so this is the beginning of the major signs before the, that is normal things that happens to people like spread of corruption, fit and things like this but it's not something that is changing in the, in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the earth سبحانك اللهم ربنا وبحمدك شهد الله لا إله أنت استغفرك وتوب إليك مالك الله فيكم وجزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله